Greetings, one and all. Welcome to another episode of Skep Talk. I'm your host, Forrest Valkai, uh, and I am going to be joined today uh, by the lovely and handsome Austin Archer, although he had something come up at the last minute, so he should be joining us a little bit later into the show, probably about 30 minutes or so, uh, no more than that. If it is any more than that, we will harass him endlessly. Uh, but before we get started, I wanted to say hi to you, the audience, the people watching this thing, this 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 uh, creation that we've put on here. Uh, if you like this show and you want to see more things like it, there's lots of things you can do. First of all, you can just subscribe to this channel. That's that's a, a really cool thing to do. You can also become a channel member or a, a member of our Patreon if you want to financially support shows like this. Channel members get uh, really cool badges and, and OGs and whatnot. Um, those are really cool things we can do. Also, uh, we have a lot of other shows on this channel that you should definitely be tuning into. Uh, Skep Talk is, you know, arguably the best one. But we also have uh, the, the Hang Up um, coming up on, let's see here, uh, on Wednesday. Uh, we've got uh, on Tuesday is uh, our first episode of Chewed Gum, which is a brand new show. Uh, it's it's, it's uh, skepticism and atheism. Uh, from the perspective of all women hosts, um, and that's really freaking important because not only is you know the atheists and skeptic space online largely dominated by dudes, uh, but also there's a lot of atheists and skeptic and, and deconstruction issues that are unique to women. Intersectionality is still a thing, even in this space. We are not immune to it. Um, and so, you know, purity culture and and uh, subservience and the demand for an obsequious nature in all things, those are some unique and, and particularly horrifying traumas that uh, we'll get to talk about on that show. I say we, that this channel will get to talk about on this show. I won't be there, but uh, I encourage you to tune into that. Uh, we've got NBOSS coming up, which is freaking awesome. We've got the Transatlantic Call-In Show where you can listen to real live trans people talk about real live trans issues and not just, you know, the uh, allies and supporters and friends talking about it. We've got the Sunday show and 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 the cuz I wanna and all sorts of different things that you should be tuning into. Get to know all of our hosts, get to know all of our shows. The goal here is to make a hub for deconstruction, somewhere where you can come to challenge your ideas and to heal from especially religious trauma. Uh we want to be there for you in any way that we possibly can. So we're trying to release new shows and new ways all the time, uh, new ideas and new new hosts and new cool stuff for you to watch so you can get your fix and you can learn some cool stuff and you can challenge your ideas and beliefs uh, because even good ideas and beliefs should be challenged. Every single one of them should. Um, with that... Uh, we have an amazing show for you tonight, because not only is my co-host, unfortunately, like I said, running a bit late, I also feel like hot trash. I'm biting the stomach bug today, so it's going to be just a great show all around. Uh, there's no way that this could possibly go badly in, in any way at all. Um, and we actually, to start with, have a, a call lined up that is specifically just for me, that somebody called in to ask me specifically a question. So we're going to jump into that. Um, but before I do, I'm also going to take uh, a little bit of time, as is my right as, as a repeating host, to shamelessly self-promote and encourage you to go check out my channel. Just search my name here on the YouTube machines uh, or go to youtube.com slash at Renegade Science Teacher because they have the app there for whatever reason. Um, about a year ago, I uh, did a video about a creationist movie called Gramps Goes to College, which is about an unassuming elderly com retired computer programmer uh, who decides to go back to college to earn his master's in biology only to realize to his horror that they teach evolution at that university. And so over the course of the movie, he uh, reveals to the audience that he is a brilliant academic and debater and also like just this total heartthrob that everybody wants to get with and that all the youths look up to as a role model and he's a chess grandmaster and he's a championship tennis player and he's an all-star athlete in every other way as he outcompetes all of the 20 something college kids in running and in 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 uh, uh, oh gosh what else in basketball and in everything else it is a very funny movie about it, it uh, just a dude's masturbatory fantasies about the arguments that he had with himself in the shower come to life 
Uh, so you should check out that video. It's about a year old, and it's a lot of fun. But the dude who wrote, produced, directed, and starred in that movie, you wonder why the character was so amazing at everything. There's your answer. Uh, that guy is a dude by the name of Donald James Parker, uh, who has made a great many uh, of creationist, Christian, right-wing, super-Republican movies uh, about you know uh, Jesus and Trump and everything else. Um, and Donald James Parker uh, actually sent me an email a little while ago and asked if I would be amicable to having an actual conversation with him, just a good-faith, civil discussion about evolution on camera that we could post to our channels. And how could I say no to that? Uh, and so we did that interview, um, and uh, it, it, it comes out tomorrow. We, we talked for about two and a half hours, uh, and I edited it just so far as to take out any unnecessary ums or ahs or us talking over each other. The whole interview is pretty much just as it was in that discussion, uh, and that video will be coming out on my channel tomorrow. Um, so be sure to go check out my YouTube channel as well and subscribe there, and also follow me on TikTok. If you want me to never see me, because I don't post there very much anymore, because it's a terrible place. Uh, and and Instagram, if you want some random pictures and threads. Follow me on threads. Everybody cool is on threads now. So find me on threads. And with that, uh, I'm going to jump on to our first call of the show, uh, which, as I said, this one specifically for me, this is Jack, pronouns he, him, called him from Texas. Jack, you are on Skeptalk. How are you doing today? Hey, I'm doing good. Thanks so much for How being here, man. I guess. I, I'm, yeah, I'm never, I, I've seen on the call screen what exactly you want to ask, but I would prefer you elaborate on like why you'd ask about it and like what's going on. Maybe you've heard me say this once or twice. Just what's going on with you? Uh, yeah, so I, um, I've heard you say this on the show and maybe, maybe a couple other places. I follow, you, I follow your Instagram, but you said that you're like personally offended by the phrase Jesus loves you. I might be misquoting you, and I was curious, like, what what about, I was, I just kind of wanted you to go on, like, a one to two minute rant on the <laughs> phrase Jesus loves you, and why you don't like it, and what specifically about it you don't like, because I know, like, a lot of people say that to me, and they say it in good faith, and they say it, like, as something that they're just trying to let me know, like, hey, Jesus loves you, he, stuff like that, because I used to be a Christian yeah. as well, and so I was just curious yeah. about your thoughts on that. Yeah, yeah, totally. Um, so this is one that the I, I, I've talked about before, but it is one that kind of takes even non-believers by surprise. And it, 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 to say I'm personally offended by it, you know, I, I'm offended by all sorts of things all the time. I don't want to give the impression that this is something that keeps me <laughs> up at night or that, you know, jumps under my skin. But, like, I do think that, uh, you know, the phrase Jesus loves you or God loves you or anything like that, I think that these are offensive things to say. These are cruel, hurtful, mean things to say. And I understand why that takes people by surprise, because it's usually, usually given as a very nice, loving, sweet thing to say. What could be wrong with telling somebody that they're loved? You know, um, Christians, uh, you know, believers of all sorts will use phrases like this, but especially here in America where I live, we deal with a lot of Christianity. Um, and they you know, will use this phrase to pass on a message of inclusivity of acceptance, of tolerance, of kindness, of welcoming, of, of, of fellowship, of companionship, all these beautiful, wonderful things. But it is also, this is not why I don't like the phrase, but I should point out, it is also very often used in a shitty and underhanded way. Uh, whenever you say yeah. that you don't believe, whenever you say that you're not interested in this religion, whenever you say that you don't like the phrase, Jesus loves you, then of course, well, I'm going to love you whether you like it or not, and I'm going to pass on my special you know, religious love to you whether you want it or not. Um, it's a very uh, underhanded and shitty thing to say. But the reason why I particularly don't like it is because I understand the, the dogma of this religion. I understand the central tenets of, of this faith, which is that we were created sick and ordered to be well, that humans are inherently sinful, evil, broken people that we are, by our very nature, corrupted beings, and that we deserve eternal torture, that hell was made 
for all of us sinners to go to. And the only reason we don't go there is through the grace of God, through the love of Jesus, by lifting us up from this torment and giving us his eternal paradise by his grace and his uh, forgiveness and his compassion and his mercy. That is an absolutely horrifically disgusting thing to say to somebody. Number one, it's a Agreed. sick mockery of love and justice. It's, it's, it's a completely twisted stance on what it means to love somebody. I love my wife so much that if she doesn't love me back, I will set her on fire. That's not love. That's a fucking stalker. That's, that's something scary, right? Um, to say that God loves us so much that he would allow us to be tortured for all eternity for any reason, that the concept of eternal torture exists in his universe means that he does not understand what love actually is because love is unconditional. I love my wife so much that I don't care, you know, what she does or who she is. I love her because of who she is. I don't love her because of what she does or because of, you know, what she gives me or what she does for me. I just, I love her. And so for me to say, I love you so long as, or I love you until, or I love you unless, or I love you except, that's not real love. That is conditional love, and that is exactly what we're being offered. God so loved the world that he gave his only son so that whoever believed in him could have eternal life. And not. Be that's a condition. Whoever loves him will have eternal life. If you really love the world, you would just give them the eternal life. But no, it's, I love you so much that I'm going to give you the option to do the thing that I want you to do, and then maybe I'll reward you. That is not love. That's just a bargain, um, and a shitty one at that. Secondly, it is a threat. It's a threat that if you don't agree with me, if you don't fall in line with my faith, if you don't back up my religion, if you don't do what I tell you to do and think what I tell you to think, then you will be tortured. You will be burned for all eternity. And on the back of that, it comes with the insult that you fucking deserve it. When somebody says Jesus loves you, what they're saying is only half of it. Jesus loves you so much that he is even willing to save a disgusting wretch like you. You are so evil and so sick and so sinful and so depraved that nothing could be more moral than you burning in a lake of fire for all eternity. God is morality. God ordains morality. What he does is and can only ever be right. So for him to send you to hell is justice, is mercy on the rest of us, because at least we don't have to go to heaven with someone as evil and wicked as you. That is the best possible thing that can happen. God himself wants it to happen, and yet... Even a slug like you can go up and join us in the theme park in the sky because you're so incredibly loved and so cared for and so, so happy and so welcome and so warm. And so, so we are so compassionate that we would extend this offer even to somebody as sick as you. And all you got to do is sacrifice your, you know, credulity, is to sacrifice your, 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 uh, creative, your cognitive faculties and your critical thinking. That's all you got to do. So. All it is, when someone says Jesus loves you, it's an insult. It's calling you someone who deserves to be tortured. It's a threat. It's threatening to torture you. And it's a sick mockery of what love and compassion and community and kindness actually stand for. And the damnable misery of it is even the good side of it, even the heaven, sounds like hell to me. Because when you look at the heaven on offer, it's Certainly not something that I would ever want to be a part of. So that, that's you know, the long and short of why I definitely don't go along with this, this phrase. Why I don't, don't vibe with this phrase, Jesus loves you. Because at the end of the day, it is an underhanded, um, uh, shitty thing to say. A cruel and mean thing to say to somebody. Uh, a, a really twisted and sick thing to say to somebody that unfortunately far too many people see as something kind and generous and, and welcoming and warm. And the fact that they feel that way speaks to the insidiousness of this religion. It speaks to the insidiousness of that kind of thinking, that they also must then believe that they are deserving of that kind of torment and that they are getting a gift by not being tortured. 
I've got news for you. Not being tortured should be the bare damn minimum. Not a gift, not a prize, not a, a, a special bonus, not a reward. That should just be the moral standard. If there is such a God in this universe, I already have enough problems with him. But to add on, if you're really lucky and you behave, I might not torture you. Not a great look. Not a great bargain. Not a great deal. Um, so that's, that's why I, I don't like this phrase. And when you add on, especially, as I mentioned before, that it's usually used in a really shitty backhanded way to say, ah, yes, well, of course, you, know, you, you disagree with me. And I, I know you're gay, but Jesus loves you. You're this historically oppressed group that we used to set on fire, but Jesus loves you. Oh, I, I know you're of a different religion, the people that we are commanded in the Bible to go out and slaughter men, women, children, and livestock. But hey, Jesus loves you. I know you're into interracial marriage, the type of thing that we used to you know, persecute and, and, and had illegal for a long time because something, something about mixing of tribes. And for a long time, we fought against it. But hey, Jesus loves you. And at the end of it always comes, Jesus loves you so much. And he needs a little bit of your money, too. So that's that's the answer for you, man. I hope that that covers everything. Uh, yes. Uh, that, yeah. I, that's that's uh, yeah. That kind of covers it pretty well. I, I remember you said something a little little similar to that um, mm -hmm. on your uh, what what was the video? It was a stream you did. Ask an atheist day. You you did one of those oh. and kind of answered that question. In, in a little, in shorthand, and I was wondering if you would expound upon that. But yeah, I yeah. thank you. I appreciate. To the there's this one guy who said in the in the chat. I have it up right now. Who said like, oh, this entire speech should be clipped. And I'm like, yeah, I agree. That's kind of why. That's kind of <laughs> why I called. I kind of I kind of wanted something that I could clip and save in my phone in case anyone ever asks. And I don't feel like <laughs> <laughs> I don't feel like expounding. Um, although I yeah. like to talk, so usually I might end up doing that. Anyway. Well, thank you. That's that's very kind of you. And yet, yeah, that's that's the whole thing, man. Is that like you know? There's that I I tried to start at the very beginning by saying you know there's lots of things that offend me all the time, and and so like it's I don't want anybody yeah. thinking that like it, I, I'm surrounded by religious people all the time. If somebody says this to me, it's not like I'm gonna jump through the roof and and be upset about. It. I'm not you know gonna be triggered by of course whatever. They, but just but yeah, that, I think it's really important to get those perspectives out there and 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 a share. A different way of thinking about it because you know it's like the old douglas adams quote about religion the reason half the reason we do this show is that you know we are not allowed to speak ill of these things why not because you're just not and it's such right. a way that at this point i find a lot of religious people even though they are able to grapple with the fact that non-believers exist they don't understand how you could have anything but a positive opinion of what they believe um and that fucking and so I feel I hope I hope things like that uh, or things like that that particular opinion will help to kind of just wake people up to why we do this. You know, I could be an atheist and yeah. be quiet about it, but I just so happen to also think that this religion is not only wrong but also harmful, and that's why we have this show um, and many shows like it. So yeah, I hope that yeah. helps, man. Thank you so much for for calling in and asking me about it. Yeah, yeah, no, I pleasure to talk to you. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, Have an awesome rest of your day, Jack. What? Oh, sorry. Yeah. What's up? Oh, I was just gonna like it's more of an academic type question. Did you, uh, when you were in school for biology, mm -hmm. did you ever do a chemistry lab where you synthesized indigo? No, no, I did. No, I, you didn't. Uh, no, I never did. I, I really hate chemistry labs, and so I did as few of them as I could. <laughs> <laughs> I had to. Fair, I was uh, fair enough. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I never did. Why do you ask? Uh, well, because I'm about to do it Wednesday, and I was curious oh. as a scientist whether or not you remember doing that in your, in your, um, I guess academic no, days. The, you could say the the farthest the farthest in a chemistry lab that I ever did was during my undergrad. I I did an organic chemistry lab, and it was uh, the worst thing I've ever done. And uh, I loved organic chemistry. Really? Organic chemistry lab. Uh, can suck every genital that I own. It was a god awful, <laughs> and uh, I just remember, you know, one of the easier things we had to, uh, 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 you know, take all of the caffeine out of a, a bag of tea. We we steeped it, uh, some tea, and then the whole thing was to extract the caffeine from that. And it was 
simple step-by-step instructions on how to isolate it and then how to precipitate it and then how to evaporate off everything else. And you would be left with a boiling flask with like this, you know, kind of just smear of crystals on the bottom that was all the caffeine in that tea bag. Um, and it took like 30 minutes for everybody to do it. And I was there for an hour and a half to get like this tiny <laughs> little dredge of just something. And I'm like, I swear I poured all the same things into the same things. I don't know what I did wrong. I just, I, I absolutely despise chemistry labs. I, I wish I was better at them, but I'm not. Yeah, good luck to you. That's, that's, Indigo, uh, yeah. 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 Indigo manufacturing is a really cool thing. And I'm sure you'll learn some interesting stuff about it. Uh, I don't envy you, but I envy what you will learn. Yeah, I, I mean, I'm a mechanical engineer, so I only have to take one of these. And so I'm, I'm happy to yep. get out of the way. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not too big of a fan of chemistry, but, uh, you know, it's, it's been easy so far. We got to set stuff on fire, so, you know, I was happy about that. There but you go. I was just, That's the best. just wanted to ask you about that. But thanks for taking my call. Really appreciate it. Uh, thanks. I didn't know you did, yeah, didn't know you did an interview, but I didn't know yeah, you did an interview with uh, Gramps. But I, oh, I absolutely will. I was very excited to hear you say that. <laughs> yep, it'll be out tomorrow. All right, man, have an Excellent. awesome rest of your day. Well, We're going to jump on to the next one. You too. See ya. Take care. What a nice For- dude. Forrest, can you see me? Can I can what? Can you see me? Can you see me? Oh, my glob, I can. Hey, you're early. <laughs> <laughs> What's up, man? That's going well, I, dude. I'm glad you're here. Austin Archer, everybody. Check him out. Um, yeah, I, I, I hope you weren't waiting for too long. No, I just jumped in and I was like, I don't Perfect. know if if you can see me or if I, because I'm like up in a, there's a, there's a one of me that's up in a little corner and then there's one down here that's on mm-hmm. a, like a two second lag. And uh, yeah, 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 <laughs> yeah. The two second lag is what everybody else is seeing. That's I always I always try to cover that up because it will drive me crazy. <laughs> well thanks so much for being here dude i really appreciate it how are you how have you been i've been really well i've been really well i i uh so i we just finished um a massive charity project for uh, uh doctors without borders that'll be coming out uh, over on my channel um starting in june uh we played uh, a game called tales of the valiant which is a tabletop D D type tabletop game um and we played for about 30 or so solid hours um, <laughs> just to get this insanely uh, long uh, series all at once that we could then release from like June to September, every single episode of which is going to be raising money for Doctors Without Borders uh, in order to help out with the worst places in the entire world uh, because that's where they operate. And so we got to be pretend magic heroes in order to hopefully help the actual heroes doing the actual work in the actual world to save actual lives. Um, so that and a lot of school is, and then also all of the trips this summer and also all the conventions. And then the line is here and just, just everything. I just, I am a deeply just, tired person. <laughs> just so busy. That's great. Uh, I, I'm so it's sorry nutty. for being late. Uh, I'm, I'm okay. sorry for being late. Uh, time, time zone mayhem in my brain. I was like, wait, that's right at the end of this meeting that I'm doing and uh, I'm going to be late. I'm sorry. Just fine. It's not a big deal at all. How are you, by the way? What's going on in your world? Tell the, tell, tell the viewers and everybody where they can find you and what you're up to and what sort of things you're working on right now. Hey, everybody. How's it going? I'm Austin Archer. Uh, second time on the show now. Uh, you can find me on my YouTube channel, Austin Archer, or you can find me on Instagram or TikTok or Threads or X. Uh, at your pal underscore Austin uh, on all of those things. I'm still just up to my old shenanigans. I'm making videos. I'm making um, video essays now on my YouTube channel. I've been doing that for like six months, and I like that, the long form, you know, 30-minute to hour-long sometimes videos on different topics. And it's everything from like socio-political commentary to like sometimes I'm just breaking down movies that I like or don't like. Uh, but, uh, speaking of movies too, today, um, uh, these two movies that I'm in this summer, the big trailer dropped today. It's going to be in the Dune 2 movie. It's Kevin Costner wrote and directed this movie, these movies called Horizon and American Saga. And I'm in them as a cowboy right on. And, uh, Hell yeah, yeah. and the trailers trailer dropped today. So it was a fun day. That's awesome. 
I will yeah. absolutely be checking that out. You have yet to yeah. put out a thing that I haven't enjoyed. So I'm 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 genuinely stoked to like see you know your your cowboying and also all of the things on your YouTube channel as well. So everybody yeah. watching, please go follow Austin on all of the things. Go check him out because he's a, a genuinely fun dude. Um, we've got uh, a couple of calls ready to go on the line. Uh, so far, our callers are all atheists. who are calling in just to ask like detail questions and little ways like how to deal with people <laughs> and things. Um, but as always, lines are always open for theists who want to call in and ask some questions. Yesterday, um, I did the Sunday show and we had a couple of people call in and ask questions specifically about evolution and how I know the earth wasn't made 5,000 years ago from a guy. Uh, and uh, those people promised to call back in today when we had more time. So let's see if that happens. <laughs> I'll hold my I, would, I would love to talk about how we know the earth wasn't made 5,000 years <laughs> by a guy. <laughs> a guy. I love that line. I think it's the last time you were on. It was just some guy. And I've, I've been using yeah. that ever since. And it makes me laugh every time. Just some guy. Yeah. So good. Um, yeah. but, but before we get there, if it's cool with you, I'm going to jump right into somebody that I think uh, you would actually have something to say to. Um, uh, we've got Cody uh, calling in from Iowa. Pronouns he, him wants to talk about how to respond to somebody who claims that God speaks to them, but won't speak to me because it's my fault. Uh, Cody, you are on Skeptalk with Forrest and Austin. How are you doing today? Good. How are you guys? Really good. So that's what I've got on the call screen, but please elaborate. Tell us your story and what, what exactly you're talking about. Yeah, the, the longer the short of it was that I got onto a conversation with a theist, um, and I, and I tried pinning him down with, like, you know, how can we use faith to get anywhere? And I kept getting stories and um, that I don't know, but it felt more like a, I'm sorry, you can't do this. <laughs> I don't yeah. know, which is really frustrating. But the, yeah. the, the crux of, my, of, my, of what I'm calling him was that he gave me an example where he was in a really terrible part of his life and had a gun to his head. It was going to kill himself when God or uh, either put a thought in his head or spoke to him to not do that, as he has more to do with him. And then later, I brought up the point that, uh, so like I had uh, our, one of our sons actually died last October. Um, he was only 13 days old. And uh, um, so I asked, you know, why, why is it when, he, when I held my kid dying, did he not speak to me? And mm -hmm. his reply was, well, that's the main character syndrome. How dare you ask God to talk to you? Mm. Which then I rebutted with, you know, well, he spoke to you, but not me. And it, I mean, we're like two weeks into this now, and it's still been just bothering me this conversation. I don't know why. Yeah. I didn't know if you guys had like a better, a better take on that or just something just calm me down. Cause it just, and then, and then he had the audacity to text me later and be like, I'm sorry, you're angry at God. And I'm like, I'm not mad at him. Oh. I'm mad at you. <laughs> oh, no, sorry. Uh, yeah, no, I definitely have some things, but I'd be more interested because Austin, you actually have a religious background, so you might have heard some things like this before. Like, is there some particular that resonates with you about that? Yeah, that's so. Um, I'm so sorry that that happened. By the way, uh, I'm really, really sorry for your loss, and I'm really sorry that that was the experience you had. Uh, it, it, I, I really don't think that theists understand how hurtful they can be when they say stuff like that. Like how just cruel something like that is um you know it's it's sort of like uh uh that that uh, that that clip where that woman's being interviewed uh in the rubble of a, tw a twister that hit her town and she's like on mm. cnn or something and the anchor says like i mean don't you just thank god that your life was spared and she's like no not at all she's like i'm an atheist and like i just think like why did this have to happen like she's like lots of my neighbors are dead and my house is yeah. gone. She's like, so I, I'm definitely not like thanking God that this happened. <laughs> She's like, it's not cool. <laughs> um, as far as, you know, how to respond to a person like that, I'm not sure that there is a way to get a person like that to hear you. If you want to have a discussion with them or a discourse that maybe could be productive, I think that you see uh, on shows like The Line, 
uh, a really good use of the Socratic method where you just ask questions about like, maybe not discounting that person's experience and being like, okay, so like, I'm not going to call you a liar that, that you had an experience where something came and intervened and helped you in this really dark moment of your life. Uh, what makes you certain that that was the God of the Bible speaking to you? Like what, 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 what evidence do you have to know that the voice that you heard that was very useful for you was the God of the Bible? And, uh, why could it not be, you know, uh, the Buddha speaking to you or one of your ancestors coming to you in a ghost form or like, like you from the future time traveling and telling yourself like, no, 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 no. There's a really cool thing. You know, like, like why, why could it not be any number of these other possibilities? Yeah. Um, but yeah, it is, it, it, the tricky part is getting them to understand like how cruel it is to be like, oh, well, you're just not as in touch with God as I am. And that's why God didn't come to comfort you in your time of need. Uh, that is, you know, that is the the big mystery question because I'm a person who's had the intervention of some kind of thought coming to me to help me in dark times of my life. Uh, I'm six years sober, and one of the re the things that happened at the time that I was getting sober is I started hearing a voice over and over again that would pull me back from the edge. I was really suicidal, and it would pull me back, and it got me into rooms where I started getting sober. Uh, but then. You know, two years into my sobriety, my best friend died by suicide. And I had this thought over and over again, like, well, why didn't anything come to get him? Like something came and got me. How come nothing came and got him? Uh, and I think that instantly attributing that interventionalist voice to it must be the God that I was raised with and taught about as a kid uh, is sort of a very normal human thing to do. What that person probably isn't doing is being curious about, like, what else could it be? What else, what other options could it be other than just the God that I was taught about as a kid? I don't know if that's helpful, Cody, but that's what it, no. it initially comes to my mind. No, and you're right. Um, I've been watching the PCA and uh, now the line for a couple of years now. And I definitely started off with that where it was very much. Uh, Oh, I have faith. Well, how can we use faith to get anywhere? And I jokingly used, because I think they were getting hung up on atheists, so I jokingly used the god Nurgle from the Warhammer Fantasy as my counterpoint. And so everything they said, like, oh, well, you know, he'll write your name in his book. I'm like, well, Epidemius has to write your name in his book to be welcome to the garden. And it came down to him just, again, it, it was such a dead end because it was, um, he would go, oh, well, I mean, if that's where you end up, that's what you end up. And I go, well, but then how do I know I'm right? He's like, oh, no, I'm right. It's just, it's, I'm very sad that you would end that way, in that place. And that, that's how the conversation did open up. And it was just very frustrating that trying you know, to go down that path led to either I don't knows or I pity you, you know? And then, and, but then like my kid and his suicide was where it just ended up where, and like, I, I'm an atheist. I don't have any questions about that. I'm very comfortable with my belief. It was just so frustrating in that moment to be like, oh, when I can kill myself, I can hear it. But when your kid's dying, you're, like, and I'm not trying to joke about it, but, but yeah, sorry. No, yeah. I, you know, and I, I, I hear you. And I, I just want to say, I think oftentimes the fruit of these conversations, we're not lucky enough to get it, to see it born in the moment. Sometimes we're really just planting seeds with people and if they are open and curious and they are people who like to continue the process of learning and and developing their perspective on life the fruit of that conversation might bear years down the road and you're not lucky enough in the moment of that conversation to see it come to fruition but it doesn't necessarily mean that that person might not later on go oh that's what he was talking about and you're you're planting a seed. You're you're offering it. You know, it's like I often ask people who believe that I'm being deceived by Satan, and I'll ask them like, "So you believe that I think the things that I think because I'm being deceived to believe the things that I think, correct?" And they're yes, of course. And it's like okay, so then you do believe that there is some kind of powerful figure in at play in the universe who has the power to 
influence our decision making and 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 influence our worldview and it's like, and satan is this person yes okay well what what makes you so certain that your thoughts and your choices in your life is not being influenced by this magical unseen figure and they it's really tough for them to actually answer that in any kind of concrete way other than just well the bible tells me that it's not and it's like well sure but what if that's his book what if that's what if the bible is satan's book and he's just doing a really good job on you you know and usually in the moment you're not going to get a theist to be like oh damn good point but if you can plant those seeds of just thinking about walking down the logical path of their own beliefs it might hit six months later two years later five years later mm. yeah yeah you you started this whole thing austin when you when you started responding one of the first things you talked about was like theists don't realize how hurtful these things can be and like how condescending and how shitty these things can sound uh before you got here um the the first call we took was someone who called in specifically to ask me i frequently say that phrases like jesus loves you and god loves you are like really hurtful cruel shitty things to say and uh, just to briefly summarize because everybody's already heard me say it is because what that's saying is you are so disgusting and wicked and sinful that the best thing that could possibly happen is that you're burned in hell forever but it just so happens that i have this twisted mockery of love that gives you an out and that's what i call inclusion and it's really fucked up um and so that i feel is the same thing here when someone's saying you know it, it, it just really rung the same bell for me to say oh yeah god loves me so much he protected me with the same breath as but also your child had to die for whatever reason um i remember one of the things that pushed me from atheism to anti-theism was a, a guy i used to know his daughter died after like she was like a month or so old and it was just SIDS. She just died. And we don't know why. And we went to the funeral and they had a preacher there. And the preacher said how wonderful it was that she died so young. So she never had a chance to offend God. Mm. And she was, she was before she ever sinned. Um, and I could not fucking handle that. I had to. Leave. Um, and it was hard to be there for my friend with that. You know what I mean? So like that for me is the same thing that I'm hearing here with, with you is that like, yeah, I understand something fucking unthinkably horrible happened and you had to suffer through it more or less on your own. Uh, but don't you know that there's all this great wonder and great plan and great beauty and great, and just what a slap in the face to say this, this fucking mindlessly horrible thing that no one should ever even have to think about was actually a net positive or part of something bigger than us. Um, I couldn't imagine hearing that and not hitting somebody. So, like, good for you for being calm and patient. It, it, uh, it, it, it was just the audacity that he called me wanting to be a main character when he literally yes. gave a main character example earlier. And that's what was so exactly. aggravating in that moment. Precisely, um, yeah. And so, like, I, that's, like that whole thing, it, it to me, it just jumps out as like, you know, if, and I think Austin already hit every nail on the head here, but just like, why, why pick and choose? What is the purpose? If, if, if this intervention comes at the rate of random chance or better or worse, if it comes in such different ways that it's unrecognizable from one person to the other, if it doesn't come, you know, when it's needed most in so many ways, you know, if, if the same God that can tell you like, Hey, you know, you probably shouldn't jaywalk today and put this weird thought in your head and make you do a thing. Can't stop a terrorist attack, then what the fuck is the point? Um, so, yeah, it just it's, it's deeply troubling and problematic. And as you're asking how to respond to this person, um, I've, I have found a lot of success, and I've, this has been a kind of a trend on TikTok, to rather than trying to start the argument and explain your position, put it back on, that's a, wild thing to say to me what a horrible thing to say and then they get to think about why that might be the case because if you say why it's horrible they're already as you're talking they're coming up with a reason to disagree with you but if they have to take some time to think about why it might be horrible maybe they might come up with a reason um and that might be even maybe better than you could have articulated because at least it's in their voice that's one that i really like 
but that's just me. I, like I said, I think Austin already like nailed it so many times. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll wrap up. Um, Austin, thank you though. Uh, I do do that when I do get questions. I've taken a lot of like thinking lessons from the show just in general. And I do hope mm-hmm. that maybe it does get through them a little bit. Uh, Forrest, you're right. Uh, I did push back heavily on that being like, why, like how, but I may have came from the wrong direction. So perhaps I should have stepped back and, and, and reassessed that. So thank you. Uh, I will no, just say this, and then I'll, I'll leave you guys. Be... Yeah, and it? like, yeah, I mean, like, yeah, you know, you're right. Like, it, yeah, it's such an aggravating thing. Because, and then, so, so like, your your story with like the the, the other funeral. Uh, mm-hmm. I like after the, the day after or whatever when my my son had died. It just like I just knew there was gonna be someone at the fucking funeral who was gonna say they're in a better place or or whatever it was. Mm-hmm. And I I told my wife, I'm like, look, like. If someone says it to me, uh, I'm not. I'm not hiding it. My kid's funeral. I'm, I'm gonna fucking throw yep. hands if they tell me my kid's in a better yes. place. You know, and so luckily party, no you one did. And it was a very. What's that? Yeah, it's it, it's. Uh, my wife and I have already had that discussion as well. If when one of us dies, um, she has a very religious family, and so like. What are we gonna do if somebody comes up and says some shit like that? That's just it's hurtful, um, and it's not something you would do to them. So can you imagine if if a religious person was attending a funeral of a family member and you came up and said, "Hey, just so you know, they're not anywhere; they're just gone," and you just say that to somebody and just fucking rub their face in that? God, that sucks. Uh, I, I yeah. think, or, or I'm happy I they think, died. What, what a great thing that yeah, they're exactly. gone. You know, like, what a wonderful yeah. thing. Yeah, right. oh, I've been counting the days. I, I think that. I think so many people have a really hard time uh, responding to someone who's in active grief and who's in an active mourning process. It makes people uncomfortable and it's like a mirror of like their greatest fear. It's like the thing that they're most afraid of. And so they, people often say things that are unintentionally hurtful or just come out clumsy or awkward, but I don't think anyone more regularly says hurtful and unuseful things than theists when people die because they're always going up to people with what they think is a comforting message saying isn't it just nice to know that you know they're in a better place now or you know and it's like the only thing i ever say to a person who's grieving is i just say i'm so sorry this happened to you this sucks so much and just like really acknowledge like that fucking sucks i'm so sorry and uh like That's all there is to it is just to be like, I see your pain and I just am so sorry you're feeling that. And like, there was this really religious family that I grew up with um, uh, that recently lost their daughter. She's 35 years old and they lost her to cancer and just, just brutal, you know, Uh, not nowhere near old enough to be, uh, or I think she was like 32. And I was so happy to hear I mean, not ha- I'm not happy, but my brother was at the funeral. My brother, who is uh, an atheist, was at their funeral, and their believing, you know, devout religious mother just looked at my brother, and she just said, this fucking sucks. And he just said, yeah. yeah. And in the church, she said that to him, and he just said, yeah, yeah, it really sucks. I'm so sorry. And, you know, but he, it just was like, she just was like, yeah, I don't want anyone to come up to me and tell me that it doesn't suck, that my... 32 year old daughter's dead <laughs> you know like it sucks <laughs> yeah and, that's, and it's, it's, a little, it it's hard to be like not that's the line yeah and, and it's hard to be like you know i lost my mom you lost yours i know what you're going through and it's like you, you kind of don't too because it is unique so it, it, you're right like yeah. the only answer really is just it sucks um mm-hmm. i'll just say this and I'll, I'll leave you guys to your show because i know i know for us like to ramble and i don't want to stop your your evolution conversation uh, <laughs> But my, my wife and I, uh, for anybody who is out there dealing with, with grief or maybe a loss of a child too, my wife and I immediately agreed that we wouldn't hide anything from each other. We would immediately vo- vo- voice any feeling or concern we had, and, and we've been stronger uh, knowing the divorce rates after a lost child, you know. Um, yeah. So just, just be open with your partner and, and, you know, be there for each other and understand that they'll grieve differently. My wife knows I make jokes and don't always be the most appropriate and she doesn't take it as hurtful and she, she understands and I understand her and just anybody out there, you know, uh, be, be open and, and, and trust in your partner. So, but thanks guys. I'll let, I'll let you get to it and, uh, have a good show. You too. Thank you, Cody. Bye-bye. Thank you. 
And I, I feel like that's so important to be able to, you know, a partner or anybody else, just understanding different methods of communication. Because I'm the same way as Cody. I, I, I think laughter is the best defense against the universe. And so, like, I'm always laughing and making fun of things, even especially the things that are deeply inappropriate to laugh at. Those are the things I'm going to try to find some sort of humor in just to make myself not go insane. And so, like, I remember when I uh, had a friend, his dad died. And we hung out and, and we laughed and joked about it for you know a little while. And then like a month or two later, my dad died. And he calls me and he's like, I'm so sorry, bro. And I'm like, dude, if I knew it was fucking contagious, I wouldn't have been around you so much. Like, this is the problem. Like, that, we were able to just like immediately start laughing at how shitty the situation was. And that was the only way that we were able to stay sane. And so like, I think that's so important, but it doesn't work for everybody, <laughs> I guess. I couldn't imagine being too serious, but I know some people have to be. <laughs> I get it. Yeah. Uh, it's just an individual process for sure. Yeah. Before we move on, though, yeah. there was a lot of talk uh, in that call about suicide and grief and everything. And I always like to just throw out there that 988 is the suicide hotline here in the U.S. Uh, it's uh, not just for suicide either. It's the uh, uh, suicide and crisis lifeline in general. So if you were in a really, really bad place, if you're you know uh, struggling a lot with just dealing with this world it never hurts to call there's people that are always there 24 7 ready to take your call and talk to you and it is a nationalized non-religious call line that you can talk to some peoples um so i always recommend people do that if you need to it, it's there for you for a reason don't be afraid to use it and if you think you might need to use it just fucking use it don't sit around and wait like you oh i don't deserve it or i'm not bad enough or somebody else needs it like, I've called it. Yeah. How was it? Was it great? You know what? It's funny. I mean, I don't know if they're all like this, but uh, it was it was helpful for me at the time. But the girl that I talked to was like really like blunt with me on the phone. She was like, what's wrong? And I was like, well, I think I'm going to kill myself. And she was like, why? And I was like, I'm really, really unhappy. And she was like, mm, don't. <laughs> and I was like, oh, oh, I was like, okay. And she oh, was like, yeah, when you no. put it that way. I was like, he was like, do you have people in your life that would be upset if you were dead? And I was like, yeah. She's like, yeah, don't do that to them. She was like, just like, hang out. She's like, just talk to me on the phone. She's like, what's going on? She's like, tell me what's going on in your life right now. And I was like telling her, she's like, yeah, okay. She's like, she's like, that's all right. She's like, that happens to people. You know, but like she was just very yeah. like, I kind of needed someone to be like, yeah, that's all right. Uh, don't do that. <laughs> yep. Yep. I love that shit. And that's, I, I have a, a couple of friends that were trying to kick drug habits and like that was, that was my thing. Like, it, next time you feel like using, just call me, and we'll do literally anything else besides meth. Anything you want, <laughs> and like that. And I feel like that's the same thing with these lines. It's just like it, we could do anything you. We could talk about whatever you like, as long as it's not you know what you're trying to do right now. It's it's just that exact kind of thing is so helpful and so useful and so nice. So yeah, check that out, everybody. Uh, because uh, holy crap. We, it's nice to have you here. The world is better with you around. I want you here. Uh, so just just you know, try it out. It's a cool thing. We have um, a few other calls left. Still surprisingly no theists, uh, but that's okay because I feel like we could do have lots to talk about regardless. Um, but I do have an atheist here on the line that I feel like we might have a rough time with. I don't know. It's, it's just what I'm seeing here on the call screen. It's up in the air as to how this could go. Uh, we've got Mark, pronouns he, him, calling in from Arizona, who says that science cannot be used solely to discredit religion. Um, we're, we'll have a talk about it. Mark, you're on Skeptalk. How are you doing? Uh, hey, Forrest. It's uh, great to actually talk to you. And uh, is Austin Cheers. on the line, too? Yes, he is. Oh, that's amazing. You, you two are... <laughs> well, no, I mean, you two are probably the best to actually take this call, uh, given his... He's the Walla Walla psychologist professor, right? Uh, what, Austin? No. no. Why the opposite? <laughs> no. <laughs> oh, no, I'm, I'm, I'm like an actor and a musician, but I talk about this stuff a lot. <laughs> well, I, I, watch, I watch your stuff, Austin. I like the uh, whole arguing with people that I agree with and whatnot. I, I respect your, uh, your approach to it. My, so I'm not going to waste any more of your time. My argument was that uh, science itself is a concept, which is the explanation of the natural world cannot be falsified. 
because it describes the natural world. And what I mean by that is that any potential falsification would require the existence of the supernatural to falsify it. But mm -hmm. if you were able to detect the supernatural, it would be part of the natural world, and that would defeat the fact that it was the supernatural and can't, uh, cannot falsify science at that point. Sure. Um, my thing that I have an issue with the way that this is structured is that just you don't need science at all to, you know, falsify or to, to do away with or discredit the supernatural world because we have no examples or evidence of anything supernatural. As you put, if a supernatural thing existed, it would be in the natural world. Therefore, it would be natural. So for the same reason that I don't need to use science to discredit the belief in pixies, until you show me evidence of a pixie, I don't even need to have the conversation with you. Um, I think it was Hitchens yeah, who definitely. said that which can be asserted without evidence can be dismissed without evidence. And I feel that yeah. same way about the supernatural. Definitely science helps to have a reasonable discussion, but uh, I don't think there's anything that's particularly necessary for dismissing it because we haven't shown that it's a thing that even needs to be dismissed. It doesn't exist. That's where I'm at with it. Am I missing something? Uh, not really. I mean, it, it's just that it feels like the same magical reasoning used by the religious theists is, uh, that circular logic of, uh, it doesn't have to justify itself. It just is, is being used to justify the existence of science. Is the only difference being one is detectable in the natural world, which I, I guess itself mm -hmm. is self-actualizing. But I mean, if we if you go over the axioms of uh, what science is based off of and what religion is based off of, and you look at the two, neither are really falsifiable. If I'm if I'm explaining that properly, I, well, I can vibe. Are with you that. saying? Are, are you, wait? Are you saying that? The natural world and science is unfalsifiable? Yeah, yeah. In, or, in order to actually falsify science, you would have to have something that was supernatural as science defines the natural world. You're using science as a term of like this kind of broad blanket, like the best understanding that we have about the universe as a physical yes. reality, not science as a process, right? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. No, because science as a process, okay. it, it relies on the empirical observation to be falsifiable, and all right. that. Yeah. Yeah. So science as but, a thing has to be falsified. You're talking about like, yeah. there's no way to falsify that we live in a physical reality because there would have to be, in order for it to be falsifiable, there would have to be some possibility of a non physical reality that could interact with it or be a thing. Is that what I'm hearing? Yeah. And, and, the, yeah, and at that point, it would become natural because you would be able to detect it, thereby making it so it cannot be falsified. And since it's, I get strictly that science speaking, is a. I, I, I if you, if you wanted to get real fucking pedantic with it, I could make the argument that like falsifiability is only knowing how to possibly falsify it, not necessarily that that falsification is in any way possible. Oh my god! Absolutely. Gosh. Um, what's sorry, wrong? Sorry, hold on. Excuse me. Hi, bud. Hey, it's okay. It's okay. Yeah. <laughs> what are you doing? Yeah. Uh. Hey. What I'll say, Mark, in response to uh, your question is, I think that the 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 sort of yes. oh look at that, we've got a puppy in the room. Oh my goodness! Yeah, um, my wife just wow. uh, just opened the door behind me and just put this whole tiny dog in my office. Um, wow! I don't know who you are. Wow. Hello. Oh, do you? Oh, I assumed that was your puppy, but that she just no nope. presented you with That's that random puppy. puppy. Wow. Just a puppy. Um, That's amazing. A pup. A I think pup, that pup. I think that where I hear you maybe getting um, hung up philosophically is on the idea of us not being able to disprove religion, which is this is the, a place that theists come from a lot. Is like you can't disprove anything I'm saying, and uh, like it, it, this this goes back to just the the old thing that we constantly talk about on shows like this and in spaces like this where it's just about like burden of proof it's just like i don't need to disprove your claim your supernatural claim that there is no physical evidence of that no one's ever like seen any physical or experienced any physical evidence of you need to offer me proof of it you need to offer me something that i can actually build a case for it off of uh because the reality is i can't disprove any theory about 
what the universe actually is or what is actually going on with existence and consciousness. Uh, there are just infinite possibilities and theories of what it all could be, uh, whether it's cell structure and it just keeps going out and out and out, or whether it's all existing inside of one person's dream, or whether it's a simulation, or whether it's the creation of some kind of wizard with a beard who rides around space on a throne granting wishes, whatever it is, uh, certainly there's more at play going on than what we have observed, but, you know, if, if it's going to be about, like, why you choose to believe what you choose to believe, I think that, like, a pragmatic observation of the world and of human history would suggest that, like, the Earth does not appear to be 6,000 years old. The Earth, uh, that humans... It does seem, it does appear to be that humans came up with theology and, you know, God myths as a way to explain the weirdness of the place they found themselves in. Clouds roll in and lightning shoots out of them and, and tornadoes appear and mountains open up and spew hot lava out of them. And if you don't know what those processes are, you start coming up with stories of what they are to explain them. And that seems like a you know from what we can observe it seems reasonable to believe that people are just we're just creating stories to try to understand the natural world world around them now what the natural world actually is i don't know forrest doesn't know nobody alive knows uh we just can go off of what we can observe but but it's it never has yep. been the burden of atheists or scientists to disprove a supernatural claim about what the world or the universe Absolutely. is or what well, I'm yeah. I'm not I'm not trying to say that uh religion itself has to be juxtaposed to it uh I'm just saying stating as a blanket term sci I, I because we have to address these claims individually uh, religion you have to you know justify it separately and independently of science and science independently of the supernatural, you know. Uh, so what I'm saying is that science itself cannot be properly falsified as a concept based on what I've said. And I, I want you to know that I'm not a I'm not a Christian. You guys actually helped me deconstruct over a year ago. Uh, I think it was on episode 139 of uh, atheism of your uh, on your channel that it came through. Oh, but, uh, my what my, I'm my podcast. With it, the yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. It was funny yeah. because... Oh, my God, you, you him, listened to that? Hell, yeah. yeah. I, I think back then you had told him that he has to keep his little curly coof, too. And uh, would you look at that? <laughs> That's the only reason he's I doing a great, with Austin. He's doing a great job. He's holding yeah. up his end of the bargain. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But uh, and so what I was saying is that science alone, if you look at the, the what I'd called in for, science alone uh, cannot... Uh, be falsified and therefore cannot be used to discredit religion. But uh, what I, I personally don't subscribe to religion because of logic and philosophy, as you as you had stated. Uh, that's that was my only hangup is that since science itself is not falsifiable, uh, as in you cannot detect what is supernatural because then it would be natural, and that just uh, that's all I was getting at. I see what you're saying there. Yeah, and I yeah you know but to that point then anything could potentially be true and there is no reason to give more weight to one supernatural theory than another uh, Absolutely. i'm sure you agree with that it is interesting to hear you yeah. say that you maybe began a deconstruction process or were in the middle of a deconstruction process when you heard Forrest and I talking on my podcast uh, over a year ago, because that sort of goes to the point that I was talking about with Cody earlier about like you, the, the fruits of conversations like those and of a process like those, it doesn't really happen overnight. I doubt you listened to Forrest and I on that podcast and went, Oh, I have a completely new worldview. Now it probably just allowed you to start playing around with some new ideas and questions to ask yourself about your faith. Uh, am I mistaken in that assumption or is that more or less correct? Well, I think it was more or less the, the philosophy this, that you had presented, uh, you and Forrest had presented, it, it left me with no real justification for holding on to some kind of religious belief at that point. Oh, cool. Well, I guess we uh, did just sort of slam dunk it. Oh, okay. <laughs> that was our job. Uh, was I mean, it, 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 accomplished. it did take a little, 
it took a it took a little while to get past the whole uh, hell is a uh, a place and some place I should be feared uh, fearful of, but I eventually got past that. Uh, but yeah, no, you guys definitely were the the cutting line uh, that uh, separated me from religion. But uh, yeah, no, I had only called in to uh, state that science alone cannot uh, be used to discredit uh, the supernatural, and you require. I should have. Uh, stated that you require additional uh, logic, philosophy, and other standards paired with science's backing uh, foundation to uh, fully discredit religion and science. I can vibe with most of that. I just, I, I hate, I was marginally distracted from most of the call, but like, I, I, I think that like, yeah, it's, it's as long as you're not giving way to the, uh, the theist argument, which is, you know, you, absence of evidence isn't evidence of absence and so like as long as you're not giving way to that argument where people just say like oh actually you know you can't say for sure that there isn't such a thing as blah 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 therefore your science is faulty and something 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 that that would be the big sticking point for me but as long as that's not happening i i could understand you saying that like science and religion are two different questions and therefore they need to be met in two different ways or that one Absolutely. isn't necessarily contingent on the other um, I just had yep, that conversation yeah. in the interview with Donald James Parker, which I'm going to be releasing tomorrow is, is that I was asking, you know, like, what is your hang up? What's the problem that you have with evolution? He said, well, people believe in evolution, so they don't believe in God. And I'm like, well, that's stupid. They shouldn't do that. Is God and evolution are two different questions about two different things. So even if you could prove that a God is real to me, I would still have every reason to understand and accept science because of the evidence for that. It's not like I'm, you know, it's, it, I think at one point the question came up, which he asked in earnest, which is just deeply troubling, whether or not like cancer is caused by a lack of chemotherapy. And it's like that kind of thinking, like, is, is God real because there's a lack of science or is, is, is atheism because of an abundance of knowledge or anything like that? Just, they're very different things and they're, they're, they're not contingent on one or the other. Um, I will say that they're correlated in so far as that, you know, better understanding the universe is a good cure for religious thinking, or at least a treatment. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I, I'm late to this conversation. I was surprised with the dog. And so I'm, I'm just kind of here now. <laughs> you're, you're totally I'll fine. I, I'd play with a dog that was dropped into my lap, too. <laughs> yeah. I, n no, no one blames you for us. That was, uh, you, there was nothing you could do. You had to love the puppy. Yeah, <laughs> I, yeah. Uh, I'm gonna figure out what that's about later. I guess you, you would be a you would and, be a cruel, broken-hearted person if uh, if you did not respond to the puppy. Um, <laughs> I, 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 I want to say really, I, I just want to say really quick, Mark, that I think that one theory that I like tossing around that I think is fun to just think about is that, like I said earlier, like well, uh, there's just no physical evidence to support anyone's supernatural theory of how the universe came into existence, and we need physical evidence to build sort of reliable structures for belief around. But at the same time, it's like, I'm sure that a lot of believers could hear that and be like, no, I've had supernatural experiences in my life. I've had things that science just can't account for happen to me, things that felt extra dimensional in some way that, you know, and I just, I like to think of that as like, I just think anything, and I don't want to discredit that and say, you didn't have that experience. Just like the person who says a voice came to me and pulled me back from the brink of suicide. I don't want to tell them, no, mm. that didn't happen. You're lying. I just want to think of a world where it's like, well, whatever was going on in that moment, it probably has more to do with a lack of understanding on our part and it's something that we probably can learn and maybe will have yet to learn that like it's just that's why i mentioned uh lightning and volcanoes and earthquakes and tornadoes earlier is like that stuff was fucking wild to early uh, upright hominids walking around going like what the hell is coming out of the sky there's jagged like pieces of light shooting out of like what the fuck is that and like if you have no context for what that is that's magic that's straight up magic that's happening in the sky in front of you and so i think that like even something like a ghost in your apartment we don't know that there 
aren't extra dimensional beings that are capable of like slipping through dimensional like rifts and things like we 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 just don't know that yet as a species we have not arrived at that place yet with our science but we could get there and go oh that's what that was like oh like it actually there's like people from the future who talk to us sometimes through microphones that are like you know like fifth dimensional microphones and that's what that is and we just aren't there yet with our understanding of our physical universe but it could all just be all part of the physical universe and we just aren't quite there with our science i think it was, it was uh, hegel wasn't it uh, it was hegel who said that like you know this yeah. when i experience a, what i think is a miracle or something either the laws of nature have been suspended in my favor or i made a mistake which one am i going to go yeah and I'm, I, so like, yeah when i i don't just i love what austin just said you know i don't i'm not going to say you didn't hear that voice i am going to say the voice doesn't mean what you think it means and like that's a very different thing Absolutely. I, I, I don't uh, really let, I have a lot of religious uh, family. They're, unfortunately, they're, you know, hyper-Christian, Trump supporters and whatnot, but they, uh, I, I never let them get away with arguments of incredulity or uh, dismissing things uh, or uh, not admitting that there might be an unknown, unknown variable to it. Uh, so I, I kind of get a little ribbing for that, but I, I don't actually... Uh, let them get away with it as much as I guess Austin would as a free flow, like a easy going guy. A I'm a little bit more am, like Yeah, you know, I thought you were like the golden retriever of atheists, but now it looks like Austin's replacing you there. Yeah, no, Austin, Austin is the nicer one. I am a, 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 a you know differentially spicy boy, and and I've never seen yeah. Austin be anything but sweet. Anyway, I, I, we're I gonna. Guess the, uh, we're yeah, I, I didn't want to take up more of your time. I, I guess the only uh, issue is uh, some people can conflate it with it being like philosophical naturalism like Jimmy does. I just wanted to state mm -hmm. that it's not that. It's the concept of science being unfalsifiable strictly does not lend, lend credits to the supernatural not existing. You have to add logic and philosophy in there, too. That's I, you know what? what? I'm, I'm not a philosopher. <laughs> well, yeah, and what I'm what I'm saying with my thing is that like, whatever what we describe as the supernatural might just as well just be the natural that we just haven't quite built a working knowledge of yet that it's just like oh that's just a thing that actually is pretty normal we just don't fully understand it yet we haven't actually like yeah we're not there yet like we, we haven't evolved to the point where we fully understand what that thing is so we go like that's beyond the laws of nature and it's like actually that thing is like you know it's sort of like uh dark matter in the universe we're like well light's bending around stuff out there and we can see it bending around stuff out there we're not quite sure what that stuff out there is and maybe when we understand what that stuff is we'll be like oh that actually is what this thing is over okay mm -hmm. so that thing that the light is bending around that's what makes it look like there's ghosts sometimes in your house i don't fucking know i'm just saying like the appearance of supernatural could just as easily be like oh, that's just a gap in our knowledge we have lots of those yep. well and that, that I, does I fall back on the fact in the case that several times yeah, science does naturally expand upon itself, constantly change and modify, so everything that is in the future that can be explained can be attributed to science, which is kind of just uh, more backing to my claim that science would therefore be unfalsifiable. You could basically add anything you want into science and just call it science. Sure. I guess in a weird way. All right, well... Anyway, we're going to yeah, jump I'm on the next thing. Uh, it was great there. talking to you oh, guys. Just I'll, I'll talk to you all later. Was, <laughs> Thanks so much, Mark. <laughs> Take have care. a wonderful day. Take care. You too. Bye-bye. I, I, I want to I wanna uh, say, yeah. I, I wouldn't say you can just add anything into science and call it science. I think, I think that I, there is a process there that, that yeah, requires... No, I, I that also disagree. Is. I just, yeah. I came in late yeah. and I didn't know if I missed some context to that statement. So I, I just yeah. left it alone. But like, yeah, I, yeah. you're right. Yeah. You can't just say anything is science, but I'm sure there's a thing that he meant. Um, yeah. Yeah, I think what's really important that people understand, and, and get, forgive me if, if this is something we talked about or that you guys talked about, is that, you know, science, I know he was using the term to mean, like, just our general understanding of the universe, but, like, a lot of people, especially creationists, especially theists, think that science is like this big book of knowledge that we just have to go pull off the shelf and check and see what we're supposed to believe when what it is is a process. And so, like, that's why, 
that's so important that you cannot just say anything is a science. It has to go under, like, it has to do what science does and achieve what science achieves and behave the way that science behaves. Um, also, I want to throw out there that I am extremely disappointed in the chat. The amount of people who were worried that I was going to dissect that dog just because it was thrust upon me. The amount of people in the chat that commented, I'm worried he's going to dissect the puppy now. Oh, he better not put... You think I'm not going to? You don't need to be worried. It's going to happen. <laughs> Sorry, no, I... But I just dropped scissors all over the place. Uh, I was yeah, not no, ready. I, I, <laughs> <laughs> I, um, I recently did that, uh, that charity stream I talked about. I played a character that was a doctor and I brought, these are my personal dissection tools, and I brought these out at one point during the thing as a, as a bit, and they were like, why do you have those? I was like, well, these are just mine from home. And they're like, have those been in people? And why did you bring them here? And what are you doing? And like, I forget what shit isn't normal all the time. You know what I mean? That's, that's one thing I've learned as a biologist more than anything, is that I, biologists are not fucking normal people. Uh, we, we have, we're just not, we're not right. We're strange. <laughs> have you seen, have I you once, seen the movie Poor Things with Emma Stone and Willem Dafoe? And have you seen that movie? I haven't yet. I hear it's good. I have not. It is. I, I love it, but I think it's, it, you know, it's a lot about like having an insatiable curiosity for life and, and, and Willem Dafoe plays this scientist in there who's, it's like that where like other people think he's very weird, but he's just a person who's like, my life is about just curiosity and learning how things work and learning how things are put together. Yeah. And it's, yeah, you know, precisely that yeah. that's exactly what it is. I remember one time, the, the time that it really dawned on me when I like that scientists are just not right. Uh, is that I was in, uh, it was during my undergrad, I was in an animal parasitology class. So it's a bunch of us nerds sitting around learning about the worst parasites in the world and like the horrible things they do. And there was this one, which I cannot remember the name off the top of my head. I can go pull out some notebook, but it's basically an SDI for earthworms. It's, 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 a, it's a, you know, the, this thing that spread through sexual intercourse of earthworms. And the professor is explaining this, and then he stops. He's like, now, let's take a minute to refresh ourselves on the particulars of earthworm sex. I will never forget those words. And everyone just leans in with their notebooks. And there was this moment where I was like really paying attention, and it kind of just hit me. I looked around like, this isn't a normal situation. I, I and 20 other people just got really excited for what we were about to hear. Nobody should be doing this. This is weird. Uh, I mean, we're strange. I, I kind of want to know how earthworms bone. Like that's, it's pretty you know, cool. We'll get into it. We'll get into, yeah. we'll fill in. We'll find the time. I'll pull up some diagrams. We'll talk about interesting hermaphroditic species and the cool things that they can do. You ever heard about the darts? That snails and slugs use. Oh wait, snails no, yes, are just a, yeah, yeah, the love darts. Yeah, they make little calcified darts, cover them in hormones, and jab them into each other to get each other in the mood. Because that's how it works, you know. You just stab somebody a little bit with some hormones, and they're like, "Yeah, uh, that's that's how I got my wife." <laughs> I don't know, man. I just it's, it's, the show's getting weirder, and it's already too long. <laughs> just, um, we've got a couple of other callers on the line, and what's wild to me is as i've been talking about like oh we you know we could always have theists call in uh, like four or five theists have called in um and then dropped uh they have called in waited for less than five minutes and then dropped uh we had one person saying that they have their the, a god of their own understanding that they want to debate one person talking about abiogenesis one person talk we had an atheist calling about abiogenesis as well um Somebody talking about something about you know, the, the, the sun. I don't know. We had all sorts of things. And, uh, and then they just go away. I think they're hearing us give like kind, thoughtful discussions about things. And that doesn't really vibe with them. But we'll see. I would have we'll I would have loved, I would have loved to have discussed that person's God of their own understanding. Because that's a big... That would have been all about like, it. I'm, a, I'm, I'm in recovery communities. And that's a big part of it. Is like... You get to dis you get to define what that word means to you and like a working definition yeah. of that word for you. It doesn't need to be mm -hmm. a guy. <laughs> it doesn't need yeah. to be that thing. Yeah. Yeah. I would have loved to have talked about that. 
It would have been so cool. There would have been so many things. We could have been kind. We could have been gentle. We could have been angry. We would have been cruel. We could have been all the things. It would have been a, a range, a spectrum of emotions about a thing that doesn't exist. It would have been wild. But here we are. Uh, we've got two uh, atheist callers still on the line that we'll, we'll go through. One of them, I am spurious uh, and kind of like, eh, and the other one, that's like, I, I, let's, I, I don't know how it's going to be much more than a five-second conversation. We'll see. I don't know. Um, we'll start with that one because I don't know how this could be much longer than like a, a, a very short conversation, but maybe it'll be something that you'll have. We'll see. It's uh, Charles, pronouns he, him, calling in from uh, uh, Pennsylvania or the Postal Association. I don't know. Uh, let's talk about the rise of atheism and Islam and which we think will assume political power in politics in the U.S. I could see that going both ways. We have things to talk about. Um, Charles, you're on the line. How are you? Um, hi, Forrest. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Hello? Okay. I just want to make sure. Yeah, um, this is a question that I actually called in before another line show, but I got dropped. The reason why I thought of this was because it wasn't you. It was another atheist I watched. I think it was Matt Dillahunty or, or Drew from Genetically Modified Skeptics. He brought up some statistics that Gen Z um, is like m the least religion, but also Islam itself is rising um, quite quickly. So then I thought to myself, whenever this generations of like politicians eventually kick the bucket and us Gen Zers end up in politics, which one's going to take more precedent, um, atheist or Islam's? And I want to know what you think about that. Um, I could make an argument either way, and I would say very briefly, and then I would be much more interested in what Austin has to say, because I don't have, not really my area, but I, I, I could make an argument either way and say that uh, American evangelicals are more likely to vote for Islam because at least it has a God involved versus American evangelicals are more likely to vote for atheism because at least it isn't Islam. And we have a I lot of Islamophobia that. in this country. And so, like, it really depends on which generation is doing the voting at the time, if you ask me. Um, I think if young evangelicals were to vote, it would be if people would vote for a Muslim over an atheist. If old evangelicals were to vote, they'd vote for an atheist over a Muslim, but that's just me. I don't know. What do you think, dude? Well, I, I would say that if it's a question of, like, which one of these is going to win in a race to see like who is who who are um, united states voters going to accept first you know as as a breaking of the tradition of like everyone being christian in politics uh that race has already been decided that we do have openly islamic uh politicians who are elected officials in the united states and we do have uh, openly jewish uh, elected officials in the united states i don't think we have a single person elected to congress or the u.s senate who is an atheist i don't think that's happened yet so if it's a question of like who's gonna get there first that's already been settled uh mm -hmm. if it's a question of who's going to ultimately win out it, it, as far as it uh, it concerns like the growing popularity of secularism and atheism and the growing popularity of islam which of those those growing factions will win, win over the other yeah i don't know i uh i would like to believe that as the world becomes more informed the world becomes more secular i think that that is just the natural trend and again that goes back to the other conversation that we were having about supernatural things becoming natural once our knowledge catches up with them once you understand what lightning is it doesn't need to be uh, zeus throwing lightning bolts at people anymore uh yeah for sure um another, another thing to add is um with in politics with certain issues currently I think that possibly some of them couldn't be directly influenced by religion, like something like border patrol or no, d d damn it. Um, border control couldn't be in, I mean, I feel like an Islamic candidate and an atheist candidate would sort of tackle it the same, you know, ignoring party lines, obviously. But then there's certain topics that would be heavily influenced by this things like trans issues. Uh, yeah, no, so I, I think piggybacking off of what Austin and I have already said, um, 
definitely uh, the kind of LGBT, anti-LGBT hate that we see in this country would definitely fall more in line with voting for, you know, an extremist Muslim than any secular person ever, or even a moderate Christian. I, I think that's reasonable to say for sure, because at the end of the day, you can see even, you know, now, uh, gosh, the, there, there are so many articles that have been published the past few months alone talking about, like, MAGA Republicans and their disdain for the liberal Jesus and how they talk about, like, every time there's a video of Jesus washing feet or, or Jesus being welcoming and accepting of others, there was the Super Bowl commercial, the incredibly poor taste Super Bowl commercial that talked about, you know, a uh, show oh, like yeah. uh, this... Yeah, this cop washing a black man's feet and a, a cowboy washing a Native American man's feet and all these historic enemies and all the yeah fucking weird right. Um, but um, uh, um, as a Native that, American like, myself, I found very the the cow the cowboy in particularly hilarious in a like sick twisted way. Super fucking weird, right? Um, but yeah, like that that whole thing uh, was decried by leftists as being in very poor taste, very out of touch, and a shitty way to spend $100 million. Um, but by evangelicals, it was denounced as being way too woke. And this, what is, this is woke liberal Jesus. We don't want the, we want the Jesus who brings the sword. We want the Jesus who says it's okay to hate. We want the Jesus who tells you to hate the immigrant and hate the, the gay and the, all the things. And, you know, this, this loving, you know, accepting guy. Yeah, yeah, you know, like just it like, says. Just, just like he does in the book. You know how in the yeah, book exactly. he's always saying that you should hate everybody? <laughs> yeah, exactly. That guy. Uh, yeah. And so, like, they, and there's a lot of people, like, uh, in, in there's reports from churches, from evangelical churches here in the U.S. Where, where, you know, people are angry about the new woke Jesus, which is just what it says in the damn Bible, you know. And so, like, yeah, I think definitely today uh, you would have with a, a, a large part portion of voters not a large portion of americans but with a large portion of voters i think that you would have um a lot easier time getting someone to vote for an actual crazy like the, the kind of sharia law extremist muslim that has been used by fox news to terrify old white people for the past two decades i think they'd have a lot easier of a time voting for that guy than they would voting for me you know what i mean who's up there saying oh, yeah no. actually you know, everybody, everybody should have some equal rights and protection and the government should work for you, not for corporations. That would be more yeah, scary to them. <laughs> Here, here's I an interesting in, like, thing. The prime, like, um, 2000s, like after 9-11, like that prime. Now, since I lived in like the most bumfuck nowhere you could ever be, I wasn't really exposed to like, I didn't even know anyone who was Muslim, but from the horror stories I've heard, it was like really bad, mostly because of radicalization yeah yeah no, we radicalize old white people all the time we do it we do it really one, well one fun thing that i will just bring up is that america has in all likelihood elected many atheists who just were posing as believers in order to get elected yeah. probably the most prominent that i can think of right off the top of my head is there's just absolutely no way donald trump is actually uh like religion you know no. th that man's that man's ego no. is not capable of believing in a more powerful entity in the universe than him so <laughs> like I mean, wasn't, he was president of the united that, like, states mm -hmm. but wasn't it Trump that said the line about like i about like relig i forgot it exactly what are you calling like people like religious people suckers and they were easy to manipulate and then he easily manipulated a bunch of religious suckers i don't remember him saying that about religious people i remember saying things like that about veterans but i i do i do remember him uh tear gassing a church to clear out all the protesters during blm and in, in 2020 so that he could go and take a, some publicity photos holding a bible upside down because he didn't know which way to hold it um and that he couldn't couldn't come up with a single bible verse that he could cite when asked repeatedly. And then when he finally That's did say a Bible verse, he said, two, two Corinthians. In, in two <laughs> Corinthians, it says, like, just nobody, nobody who's read the damn thing even, nobody who's attended a single service has ever called it two Corinthians. Yeah, um, yeah no, we, yeah, so I remember Trump, we had a caller. Donald, Donald Trump very well might be our, our first 
atheist president that was actually elected, mm -hmm. but uh, you, maybe, yeah, <laughs> maybe not even one that he he himself admits. He just just not interested yeah. in thinking about God at all. Yeah, for sure. Right. Oh gosh. Um. But yeah, dude. That's that's what I would think about. It's it is comp. As I said, I I I'm sorry. I know it's kind of a shorter call. I can't imagine much more to say about it. But I think I think we've covered everything. Yeah. Um. Yeah, um. Before I go and let you get to the other atheist caller, whenever you guys were talking about the um, the guy who lost his daughter, um, that reminded me of a very similar situation I had, except I asked a Christian um, something like, oh, well, well, how come, like, God will give, like, evangelical billionaires private jets or, or whatever, but, like, my dad leaves me and then never talks to me again, and then, mm -hmm. and then they really didn't give me a good answer and that frustrated me it's the same thing it's just it, it's what it god i think it was seth anders was saying you know god uh his his works are undeniable but he works in mysterious ways that we can't understand and and it, that, that oh. kind of thing and he's he's everywhere but he's nowhere he's 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 all knowing but he can surprise him and do what he doesn't want you to do and all these things it just, it's one of the many what are you thinking I'm just saying, Charles. That's that's not a mystery at all. God just likes them more than you. That's I mean. Oh, <laughs> like, that's you know? why. Obviously, yeah, exactly, yeah. yeah. Have you tried <laughs> praying harder? Um, Gosh. I've tried being more gay. It didn't work. Yeah, oh, I mean, hey, yeah, no. You gotta he try everything. Like that. You gotta try everything. Yeah, <laughs> like, yeah be you know how he's always be saying in right the Bible, now. "Don't be gay." Like he says it in the Bible so many times. It's one of the biggest things that he says in the Bible. Like every few verses, he's Obviously. like, "Also, don't be gay." Don't be gay, yeah. So, yeah, yeah. You know, what is that? That, that Jim Jeffrey Jeffrey is left, don't be like gay. he he hates gay people yeah. so much. He mentioned it like one, maybe if you read closely, <laughs> two times in the Bible. He mentioned not <laughs> eating shellfish about twelve times. But you know, everybody likes a good shrimp cocktail, so fuck that. But the gay thing for sure, <laughs> like. Yeah. It's, yeah. yeah. Anyway, we're going to move on, Charles. But well, thank you so much for calling in. We really appreciate you, dude. You guys have a good night. You too. Bye bye. Uh, so we've uh, actually got. Okay. Sorry. I'm confusion. Um, the, the person who says they have a God of their own understanding and wants to talk about it um, has called back. However, they have now listed themselves as an atheist rather than a theist. And they put a note in the call screen that says, note, God equals nature. And I feel like I've had this argument with myself before, but I'm interested in hearing your take on it, especially from the recovery program aspect that you were talking about. That sounds really helpful to a lot of people. Um, so if you're comfortable with that, I'd love to hear it. Roy, pronouns he, him, calling him from South Carolina or somebody's crotch. Roy, you're on the line. How are you doing today? Uh, good. How are you? I'm really good. So uh, tell sorry, us about uh, this I god did, of your own design. The... Sure. Uh, before that, could I get the other person's name? I don't want to say that guy. Yes, Austin. Austin. Okay. Yeah. So uh, I I am in a, a recovery community, and I'm I've been. Uh, struggling with this a little bit, so I'll just go ahead. So, <clears throat> there. Um, I'll just sit back then. I. Uh, okay. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, so, so my my understanding of uh, the uh, universe is uh, that there's a space time manifold. So, uh, what that means is. I, I know what these words mean because of the field that I study, and, and I don't I don't want to get into it. But what that means is uh, there's a surface geometry you can move around on the geometry, and there are two ways that you can move around: either uh, you trace a continuous path through this geometry, or you pop in and out in discrete steps. So the, uh, one of those two things. So if we are all uh, moving in this. Uh, ge underlying geometry, then uh, I think that, um, I, how do I say this? The, the, this? This geometry must have inflection points, like points where it is good to be in, points where it's bad to be in. For example, it, 
you are on a mountain you don't want to be on the top of it if you if you don't know how to walk with good balance let's say so that's not a good place to be in uh, similarly on this geometry there's probably good places to be in and bad places to be in and i think uh uh actions that we take as human beings not just as along in in this geometry i don't know how for example if i uh, pray for some resolve in a bad situation or meditate about it or something like that uh, i get the feeling that that has a, a, a real effect of moving me along in a direction that's good because uh before, before i joined the recovery program and i think this action that i'm taking this prayer or me- meditation somehow invokes uh something outside of me whether that's uh, tied to uh, all the other people in the world somehow or something else i don't know but it's not just me because i i did just me before joining the recovery program and it was a shit show so i i uh, and now i am starting to see by following uh another way not the just me way that things are starting to work i'm 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 having a healthier outlook towards life and all that stuff what they call spiritual fitness uh but m- my thing is that uh i do think that um this is the godly path and i think that everybody can actually attain the godly path uh if they really think about it it's not just some vague concept I don't know if that made any sense. I'll just stop there. Uh, I, I think hey, I understand, but I want to let Austin go first. Yeah, so just speaking, I, I think I understand you, Roy. And, uh, you know, I'm a member of the Secret Society as well. That's where I was before I came to this. That's why I was late. Um, I'm a member of, you know, the the thing, the thing one, the one that everyone knows about that we're not supposed to talk about because it's supposed to be secret but i'm a that i i do right. that thing and i gotta say that one of my biggest uh misgivings when i was first coming into the program was the god stuff and it is for most people i thought i was very unique coming into recovery that i was like well they're not gonna like me because i'm an atheist turns out like 90 percent of people that walk through those doors are atheists who are like i don't want to i need help with drugs and alcohol but i really don't want to do the god stuff like we all have hang-ups and religious trauma and we all like we want a secular path toward um, freedom from our uh, from our uh, addictions. Uh, I, I so I think this is an important thing to talk about because I know that a lot of atheists really, really avoid these rooms because of this idea that it's a religious program or something like that or like you're you're gonna have to get baptized at some point or you're gonna have to acknowledge you know the god of the bible in order to obtain the brand of sobriety that they're offering you what i can say from my personal experiences i've been going to these rooms for six years and in six years no one has ever asked me what my god is or how my God functions in my life, or what my conception of that God is. It's never, it's never, there's never been a worthiness check from anyone that's like, we just gotta make sure that you, your God has the right name and that the right gender and that like you believe in the same God we all believe in because if you don't, you can't keep coming around. Uh, it's totally, as far as I can tell, it is totally okay in these meetings and in these rooms to be functionally an atheist and that's how i view myself is i am an atheist in all of the conventional ways i don't believe in any of the man-made god myths uh it sounds to me like what you've got working for you right now roy is a a construct a definition of what god means to you and how god functions in a pragmatic and practical way in your life that works for you it, it's sufficient for you to have a relationship with this concept with this thing and i think that that's totally fine i think that you can you don't need to like turn your atheist card in or anything like that and i have very much a similar thing where i i believe that <clears throat> prayer and meditation has been useful for me in my life 
in my in my sober journey. Uh, that's not because I believe that there is a physical entity that is hearing my prayer and deciding whether or not it is going to grant me the thing that I am asking for. In fact, it's my understanding of the literature of the recovery programs that we're talking about that they actually specifically instruct you not to ask for things. They give you really, really specific instructions about just saying, hey, can you... Uh, help me look for opportunities to be of service. Who can I help today? How can I be of use in the world? And the way that I conceive of that, the way that that functions in my life sounds similar to yours. It's more like setting an intention. It's more like me, Austin, I'm taking the time in my day to sit down and say, today, I want my eyes to be open to opportunities to be of service. So if someone presents themselves and is in need of my help, I want to I want to set the intention for my day that I will notice that. And taking that time to be intentional about that, and you can call it prayer, you can call it meditation, you can call it journaling, you can call it whatever. If you're just taking the time to say, I really want to make sure that I'm looking for opportunities to be useful today to my community and to the people around me, uh, you're, I think you're more likely to notice those opportunities. Now, some people might think that's, the physical man, God, answering my prayer and saying, you asked for an opportunity to be of service, and I am granting your prayer and saying, here's an opportunity to be of service. That's not the way that I interpret it. I think of it as a, a very logical process of cause and effect. It's a very causal pathway that I've opened up through the intentional process of sitting down and getting quiet in the morning and saying, I would like to be soft today with my communication. I would like to be open to opportunities to be of service. And that's the working definition that I use for the word God in my life. Uh, and I think that that's a very pragmatic, practical, traditionally and functionally atheistic definition. But my program allows me to have whatever definition works for me. And it sounds like you've got a definition that works for you. Yeah, whatever, you know, when I'm, I'm listening to everything you said, Roy, and it sounds an awful lot like like you, you were describing like almost like the moral landscape from uh, 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 Sam Harris in a way, as well as with a little bit of quantum field theory mixed in there. And like, if that's a thing that kind of helps you navigate the moral world around you and the, the world you want to live in, I would be the first person to sit here and say, well, it's a functional bridge towards the kind of hard atheism that we intend to endorse in this channel. But at the end of the day, if at this particular moment it's getting you to be a better person and to be happier and more secure in your life and you're not mixing in the concept of a higher power that is literally watching you with an actual mind and cares about who you have sex with and, and you know what clothes you're wearing and whether or not you eat shellfish, then you know who am I to, to, to really pick bones? It would be it's something that we'd be sitting here and having a more depth, philosophical, eh, well, really, why do to do topic it wouldn't be the kind of topic I get heated over. Um, and definitely, you know, what Austin was just saying about, you know, intentionality and setting an intention. If you go out and decide tomorrow to look for red cars, you're going to notice there's a hell of a lot more red cars on the road than you've ever seen before, because that's what you're paying attention to. And what he's describing as, you know, I'm going to try to be softer in my communications and find a way to be useful. That sounds to me an awful lot like I, in my secular philosophy, have had for a long time as well. I've said on this show several times when people talk about, you know, what they want to do with their life and where they want to go with their life and what they finding out what they want to be, I've always said that if you want to find yourself, the best way to do it is to lose yourself in the service of other people. The way that I found science, the way that I found education, the way that I found public speaking, the way that I found communication and the way that I do it now is through volunteer work and for trying to like hell when I was 17 years old and all I knew is that the world sucked. And I would volunteer everywhere I could to try to make the world better. And I was trying to get charity projects started. I was trying to do things. And I found these were the niches that I was the best suited for. And it was the way that I could be the best help. And I worked really, really well when I tried to listen as much as, if not more, than I spoke. Um, and so that got me into education. That got me into being educated. That got me into everything. So like, if you're dedicating time and effort into navigating this this geometric landscape of life that you're talking about of uh, you know on on whatever level it's on 
and all you're trying to do is identify where things suck and where things are good and try to stay in the good places and fix the bad places as much as you can, I can't say I have an issue with it as long as you don't say, well, Jesus told me to, you know, <laughs> as long as you don't add in that extra flavor of religious trauma that's going to make it a corrupt and bastardized thing down the line. If it isn't already, then yeah, keep at it, man. I hope you feel better. And I hope you do better. That's great for you. And I think that's also really fucking cool. I'll say that afterwards. I'm gonna let you respond. Then I have a thing that I think we should wrap up. Uh, thank you. Um, I'm just uh, give me a second to digest all of that. English isn't my first language. Um, what is your first language? Okay, Bengali. Your your English is better than my Bengali. I'll tell you that. That's great. Okay. Uh, um, yeah. So the only um, thing that uh, still doesn't um, sit right with me is uh, I the intention. I I don't. So what I was saying earlier about when I do an action like prayer or meditation, I think that the influence of that action um, is uh, somehow dependent on me praying, invoking other kinds of actions that are outside of me because uh, I have completely lost trust in the idea that my own action can yield uh, good outcomes. If, if the, does that make sense? Um, uh, because it didn't before and I, I am studying a field of science and I believe in evidence, consistency, valid, validity, soundness, and all that. And it does not match my past history that I can claim that if I did something with intention, things would turn out well. I would have to put in something extra that wasn't there before that, that's working now. I think that we never stop growing up. And you never learn, you never should stop learning how to be a good person. And so I understand what you're saying. And I, I don't know you and I don't know your life and I don't know your struggle. And I don't you know what we've been through, but I respectfully disagree with you that you are incapable of doing things that are good on your own. I think what you're doing right now is a great example of you making positive steps forward and showcasing the ability to do that. And I think with continued practice, I'm very much of the mind that, that morality is a practice it's not just a thing you have or don't it is a practiced behavior that you keep up with through sheer force of will every single day i think with that practice i think you would become more and more self-reliant on it and uh, on your own thinking and your own understanding your own morality austin you clearly have something you want to add as well i'm just saying i i, I completely agree with what you're saying uh forrest and I think that i just want to say from a perspective of a person being inside of these recovery communities that and it, I, I also want people to know that like it's okay to to ha not always flow with every single I idea that's presented. And I think that one of the harmful ideas that can be presented to people, especially in early sobriety, sorry, there's a very low flying helicopter over my house right now, and it is shaking my entire apartment building. <laughs> uh, but this is God mad at me right now. Uh, <laughs> no, but. Uh, <laughs> One of the, the ideas that I've always sort of quarreled with in the recovery communities and that I, I still do today is I do think that there's a lot in the way that people talk about higher power or a relationship with something bigger than themselves that says your way wasn't working, so you need to turn the reins over. You're, if you run the show, everything's going to go wrong. You're not capable of making good decisions. You're not capable of doing good things. You need to turn the show over to your sponsor. You need to turn the show over to a higher power. And if you do that, you'll be better off. And I, I think that that's too much of a totality. It's too much of an absolutist like view of it because I still... I see people saying this all the time, like, hey, I'm, I'm nothing. I can't, I'm not capable of do, making good decisions. My, my thinking is the problem, and my brain is the problem. But I'm like, but you got yourself to the meeting today. Like, you weren't being puppeteered by some other, th like, God, you didn't just say, you didn't get in prayer and say, God, take me to a meeting today, and God just 
picked up your arms and legs and started walking you marionette style down to the meeting hall. You got yourself there. There was something in you that wanted to go to a meeting instead of going to the bar. Like there is something in you that wants what the recovery rooms are offering you. And I've met people who want it and I've met people who don't want it. And it doesn't work for the people who don't want it. And so there is, I, I think that, I think that there's a, there's a delicate dance there of like, there is a, a, an aspect of you that doesn't want to go to meetings, that wants to go to the bar instead, that doesn't want to be of service, that would rather just be self-serving. There's an aspect of me that wants that. But there is also an aspect of me that does want to be of service. And there's, I, so I think that there are these dualities and, and uh, pluralities within each of us. There are aspects of me that, that want to appeal to my baser instincts, and there are aspects of me that want to appeal to uh, my, my higher instincts. And like Forrest said, it's a day-to-day -day practice of trying to appeal to my higher instincts of like, I think I'd be better off today if I found a way to be of service than I would if I just was completely self-serving today. Uh, and mm -hmm. I think that, I do think that a problem in the program is it makes people think that any idea that comes out of my head is bad and I can only rely on ideas that are told to me by other people. And I don't know, I, I, uh, oh. I've never really liked that aspect. Yeah. Uh, Roy, whenever you go back and I hope you rewatch this call and kind of listen to what we've been saying and internalize a little bit more, especially, you know, with English, English being a second language, I, I can understand taking some time with it. When you do, um, I hope you also take a look at the chat, the live chat on this call, because when you first started talking about your, your concepts or your, what you're discussing, um, a lot of the chat was very much, very skeptical. And they were like, what is this guy talking about? Please, please hurry along. They didn't understand. But as we've continued to explore it, more and more people have been chiming in in the chat to give you some support and to say that they, they believe that you are a very thoughtful person. And the fact that you're able to have this conversation alone indicates how capable you are of making positive changes in your own and everybody else's life. Um, and so there's a lot of people here who are showing love for you. And I even put in the chat, you know, it's just like, we believe in you share some love. So, you know, definitely take a look at that maybe next time and, and just give yourself some credit where credit's due, because, uh, it's, it is a myth that you're either just a good person or not. You, you like, like Austin, and I both said, you work every single second of every single day, making right. Everything is a choice. Everything is a choice. And it sounds like you're making some damn good choices. And I think you're only going to make better ones as time goes on. Thank you, guys. Uh, I, I don't think I have anything else at the moment. That's okay. Right, have an awesome rest of your night, Roy. Stay strong and talk to you later. Thanks. You too. Take care. Bye-bye. All right. We've got one call left. Do you have anything before we get into it? I was just going to say that, like, if there is anybody out in the audience that's struggling with substance use, uh, that, you know is afraid of approaching a, re a recovery program because of the G word. Um, I would just say you don't need to be as afraid of it as you think you do. Some of the best conceptions of what God could be as a function in society and in human life have come to me through those rooms, like hearing people talk about it in a way where I'm like, oh God, I wish that that's how people talked about it when I was growing up. Like I, I, the guy said to me one day, he just said, I tell my sponsees that my only requirement for that, he goes, they can conceive of God however they want or higher power however they want. My only requirement is that they have a conception of God that likes them. And whether it's you and your higher self or it's an externalized anthropomorphic thing or it's more of an energy, a source energy of the universe or whatever it is, my only requirement is that it likes you and that it's not like out to get you or that it has rules for you that if you don't follow the rules you'll be punished and i was like i love that like really simple like call it whatever you want just don't let it be an asshole to you you know don't take shit from it and i was like yeah love i that like that key and peel sketch that key and peel sketch where we're talking about the 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 god drug the sharp thing you put in your eye you realize the face of god is somewhere inside your body but you can't find it and it hates you. <laughs> it's, yeah, 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 yeah. About that. Sorry. Um, no, it's, it's, uh, 
I, man, I think it's great. Cause like there's, there are plenty, you know, there are plenty of secular uh, recovery programs out there. I think some people in the chat were sharing some of them. And I think as long as you're getting help and you're, you're being mindful of what the help is, you know what I mean? I think that's awesome. And I appreciate you showing that like, you don't have to, it's not an all or nothing game. You can interpret what you're doing as long as you're getting the help that you need because everybody fucking needs help sometimes. And like, and that's that I think is very powerful. I mean, that's really explicitly baked into the literature. I'm not here to be a, uh, to proselytize for, um, for Alcoholics Anonymous. Like it, uh, there are, I thought many it was Fight Club. Programs. You're just, you're talking about yeah, yeah. a secret organization you're not allowed to talk about. Damn. Yeah. Uh, you know, but, uh, there are uh, many different ways. And even in the literature of AA, it's like, we don't claim monopoly on this thing. And, uh, but I would just say that like my experience is it's more secular than you think it is. It's it, it, like, yeah. it is. And there, there have been many atheists through the history of the, uh, structure of AA who made sure that it had secular dna who came in and said this thing's not going to be as as powerful as we want it to be if we say that you have to have a very specific version of your relationship to whatever the 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 higher power aspect is if you're not using language that's open to secular ideas then you're going to lose a lot of people and they built that in specifically on the prompting of a lot of atheist members uh so yeah there's a lot of atheism I built into that. it yeah, I love it. And, and that's the thing. I, I have spoken out against AA publicly because of the religious aspect of it and said, like, there's got to be, you know, there are ways to get this help without this thing. To know that there are those resources involved in it is awesome because such a ubiquitous and commonly known organization, um, as secret as it may, as it may try to be, is it, something that's so like commonly understood and something that that's you know just like it's like Kleenex. It's a brand name that everybody can recognize as a place to go for this kind of help. To know that that has options that aren't necessarily sectarian is really fucking cool. Um, and I also think it shows yeah, a lot about... Oh, sorry, go ahead. I was just going to say the only reason why I harp on it or bring it up is that like, I think it's one of the most commonly misunderstood things about the organization. Yeah. It, and myself, yeah. like when I was, before I went in, I listened to a lot of atheist podcasts that were always like, don't go to AA if you're trying to get sober because they'll get, they're going to make you believe in That's what I'm saying. Yeah. I, I thought that. And, <laughs> yeah. And I was so afraid of it. And it's, and all the time people are like, I, I would do it, but it's so religious. And I'm like, oh, I thought the exact same thing. And I was just so misinformed and it's sort of a, a beast of aa's own making because they don't believe in ad proselytizing or advertising what mm -hmm. they are about it's more about like you can come and find out and we'll tell you and you can find out if you want to but it's as a policy they really try not to go out of their way to to say much but that means that there is there are, are things like this where there are these misunderstandings where i'm like i just wish people knew that like you can fully be an atheist in AA and no one cares. Like nobody will ever stop you from attending. Maybe, and, and who knows? Maybe there's something to be said for where you live. Maybe it's different in more rural areas. Maybe, maybe it's a starting place, not an ending place for some people. There's a million things. I just want people to hear all of these different angles of it so that they know that they should go and get, it's like with the 988 thing that we we're talking about earlier. They go, get the help and then later figure out what you do with it, but at least have the, you know, the, 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 the compassion for yourself to go out and get the help to start with and then do whatever you want to do after. And I, and I think yeah. it's also really important that like the, we, you know, that, that kind of call and that kind of discussion that we just had with Roy is like one of the things that we have a lot of people who watch this show that are very, very, very hardline atheists that'll get very upset with any concession for any supernatural religious woo woo anything at all and you know, me as well i'll get in it sometimes i think it's really important to show the diversity of thought amongst the atheist community the diversity of possibility with still calling yourself an atheist and not being a douchebag how not being a douchebag should be the main thing not just the atheism aspect of it but like it's really the harm that's the problem not necessarily all the belief all the time but even a little bit sometimes i think Showing that diversity and showing that this is not a monolithic organization, channel, P 
people, uh, uh, philosophy, belief system, blah, 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 is incredibly useful in a lot of ways. I think this is one of the most productive calls we've had in a minute. You know what I mean? Mm. It's so cool. cool. Um, so we had, it was cool. We had, uh, yeah. we had one other call that uh, was waiting for a long time. They actually waited for an hour and I didn't want to take oh. it and they've already dropped. Um, but uh. the call that was waiting for a long time was asking if there are correlations uh, between things like height and IQ along racial lines. And I was going to have to give a whole explanation on how like, Sure, things like height, because of things like Allen and Bergman's rules and basic understandings of, of uh, uh, evolutionary biology amongst humans, but also like the whole IQ thing, that's a 30-minute discussion on fucking racist science and racist testing practices and a lot of dumb shit that a lot of white supremacists have tried to prop up on bad statistics, and I did not want to get into it. Uh Social Darwinism, stupid, y'all. It's not a thing. It's not a real thing. So I don't know what that conversation would have been because that person already dropped, and I'm very glad about it. But we do still have one call, and it's actually one of our mods. Uh, one of the mods of this channel, somebody who uh, listens to every single one of our shows, you know, God help them, uh, and 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 puts up with our dumb shit all the time and helps to keep our chat clean. Please welcome, uh, at long last, to the show, Tardis Chick, pronoun she, her, Calling in from not Michaels. She's not calling from a Michaels. That's what NM means. <laughs> I don't know, dude. Hi. Hey, welcome to the show. Finally, Tardis Chick. It's so great to talk to you. <laughs> Hi, I'm Forrest. How are you? Howdy, howdy. I am I am great. And it's New Mexico. <laughs> no. But, um, I thought it was I thought yeah. it was the Nether Moon. The Nether Moon. Ooh, it could like be the that nether. One. Are you currently standing in a Michaels? I I I am I, I am not. I am sorry. <laughs> well, then why would you correct me? Why? What's the point? I was right all along. <laughs> I don't know what you want from me here. Uh, uh, you 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 got me. I, I'm lying. <laughs> <laughs> you're on the line though. So what? What? I see what you wanted to call about, but I feel like there's a story here, and I would love to hear you tell it rather than me just say what's on the calls. Yes, yes. Okay, so um, my children, I have two of them, attend a um, very conservative school. It's, it's public school. It's uh, education-wise, one of the best out here. However, there's always something. Um, it is my Mexico. son had a... Um, it is. <laughs> um, <clears throat> excuse me. My son had a substitute a couple of weeks ago, and I don't know how the subject came up, but evolution came up, um, and the substitute told him... Uh, it's the entire class, I believe. Um, there's no evidence of evolution. They don't have any proof of it, so we're just going to move along with the lesson, whatever the lesson was that day. Cool. And <laughs> I emailed the school, and I told them they need to correct this problem. They never emailed me back. <laughs> um, and I've contacted them about sending home flyers for their Bible study or Bible club after school. Again, we'll look into it, you know if they answer at all. Mm. So my question is, how, uh, how do you deal with it? Because I know you've taught younger, younger kids in the past. Um, I don't know if you still do, but how do you address the evolution issue with a school that is, um, well, science backwards, I guess. Um, because my yeah. children are going to be fine. They're, my kids are going to be just fine with it because... They have me in this regard. I'm just worried about the other kids in the school, and I don't know what else to do about it. I've already contacted uh, was it uh, Freedom from Religion? I've the ACLU. I've sent letters, so hopefully those will come to something. But like, how do you personally deal with the school? Deal with this sort of thing to where they don't mm. backlash and take it out on the children? <laughs> but to, yeah, potentially that's, look that's up the question. National Center for Science Education as well. Um, uh, I would say. <laughs> For, for me, if there is a, mm -hmm. in this particular situation, it's a substitute. The school needs to be looking into that. And if they're not going to, if they're going to stand by what that substitute is saying, then I would demand for them to show, or you can actually, you don't have to have to demand it from them. You can look up online. You should be able to anyway, your state curriculum. 
they should publish from the State Board of Education should have published curriculum mm -hmm. for the school. Um, and you can look up the evolution units and the things they're supposed to be teaching about evolution in the biology curriculum, and you can ask them, bring this to them and say, all right, so here's the actual curriculum you're supposed to be teaching about evolution. Please show me in here where mm -hmm. it says there is no evidence. Please show me where this lesson was appropriate. If this is what I am paying you to teach, this is what you're supposed to be doing. Jesse Jerdax in the chat. Hello. Um, uh, <laughs> but uh, yeah, there's just... I think that's that's the biggest thing that I would you know start with is if this school is going to stand by this teacher saying that there's no reason to believe in evolution, cool. Show me the state curriculum that says that and that says that that's the lesson that we're supposed to be teaching the kids. And then also explain, you know, square that circle with all of these curricula that I can find here that explain the evol evidence for evolution. Please, please <laughs> break those down for me as well. And if they won't respond to you, take it right on up to the school board. And if they won't respond to you, absolutely. Oh my God, I'm a petty bitch, and I would be calling the news. <laughs> that's just me. Um, and 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 talk about I, I like religious discrimination. <laughs> but like you were yeah. talking well, about a I, way to handle this that doesn't affect the children, and that would not be that. <laughs> but like that's that's yes, me. because they have been known to take it out on the kids. Um, I found out yeah. the other day that my daughter. Um, they do recitation in the morning, a flag ceremony. Everybody is, has to attend. And the kids have been doing Bible verses <laughs> at the very beginning of the day. And I recently found that out, too. And so... Yeah. That, that actually is a huge me. problem. Don't, yeah, it really is. But both of them have begged me, you know, don't, don't say anything. You know, I don't want this to be a problem. You know, don't... Why, why, do, you have to, why do you have to do this? I was like, guys, you've got to stand you know, up. You know, if somebody is yeah. doing something wrong, you have to stand up to it. And I try to explain that to them. But, of course, if an adult is going to take it out on a kid, mm -hmm. which they will you know if they've done it before, uh, children have had to leave the school because of it. So it's, uh, it's a thing. <laughs> for, for me, I, you know, I, I grew up in Oklahoma, and we had, it was a see you at the poll was like the little Christian assemblies that they would have all the time. We had morning prayer things all the time. The schools that I attended, fortunately, made sure to take the legal step of not broadcasting the prayer or making it mandatory. So they didn't do it over the announcements anymore. And they had a moment of silence to reflect, meditate, pray, or engage in other silent activity every day. And that was their way of having <laughs> the ability for a morning prayer, but you didn't have to do it. And they didn't specifically say that it was just for that. They just said it was an option and things like this. But like, um, to actually have a thing where the students are actually required to listen to religious content, that is actually illegal. Um, and that is actually something that you should absolutely call a lawyer about, if, or at least I would recommend. But if your kids are worried about having it fall back on them, I'm not a parent for lots mm -hmm. of reasons. Um, but if I was going <laughs> to be one and I was going to have a child that was in that situation and they didn't want me getting involved because it would fall back on them, I would strongly encourage them to get involved. This is your first, mm. this is your lesson. You're in school and this is your lesson in direct action and activism and petitioning and co collecting your classmates together and talking about, even if you don't agree with me, even if you like the prayer, the constitution is still the constitution. This is your civics class for the day. This is what this matters. This is why this matters. You don't want to be in here having a Muslim prayer. You don't want to be in here having a Hindu prayer. You don't want to be forced to participate in a prayer to any other God. So we need to make sure that we're all protected from each other as much as we are from just the one religion. And therefore, we all need to make this petition and submit this petition to the principal. And if the petition doesn't work for the principal, then we, as the students, call channel whatever and say, you know, we we're trying to, to to make sure that our school is acceptable and welcoming and opening for everybody because we are the new generation and we are leading this nation together and we are going to make this city better for ourselves because we are engaged young citizens who are trying to be a part of the world and not just, you know, eating shit and, and all these things. And <laughs> that's what I would be all about. I don't know how politically <laughs> active your children are or what you are interested in as a parent. Um, not everybody's like me who wanted to go to every protest as a child. But that that's that's my thought. Austin, do you have different thoughts? No, I think you knocked it out of the park. I really like honestly, 
honestly, like that's so much more than what I would even do. I'd just be like, oh, we're going to find a new school for my, my kids then. But like, <laughs> and I just make it and like, fuck everybody else's kids like that. I, I can't help everybody else's kids. But like that, like that, you're right for us that like there are so many things that you can and probably should do. But I'm just sitting here just going like, God, like Dunning Kruger effect really does just run amok and uh, on us, doesn't it? Because it, it, it is. It, it's not just, you know, that the least capable or least qualified have the most confidence. It's also like that they have the least ability for self, you know, uh, uh, self, self-reflection and self-awareness. It's just like, they're constantly, they, they speak from a script when they talk about the things in society that they're afraid of and that bother them. And it's always this stuff about like, you're shoving your ideology down my throat. You're shoving gender ideology down my throat. You're shoving, uh, you know, queerness down my throat. And why, why, do, why can't you guys just go be queer over there? Why do you have to, have, why does it have to be? And it's like, these people are just so the, the 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 amount of self awareness like that they just not even a grain of self awareness that it's like everything you do everything about your beliefs and your philosophy and your ideology is you are like dead set on on forcing the entire world to live according to your beliefs dead set on like jamming your beliefs into every single possible corner and facet of public life and it's so frustrating because it's just like I, I think that so many of us would really probably be significantly more okay with supernatural belief if it if they weren't constantly trying to force the world to adhere to their supernatural beliefs. But Forrest, you're right. Th- those are all the things that you can and should do to combat. I, I my first my first degree was in education and so like we you have to identify different pedagogies different teaching styles that you like um i'm a big fan of uh positivism progressivism and critical theory uh positivism being the assertion that there are facts to be known about the universe uh progressivism being like question based based learning and like getting the kids to participate in the lesson and not just teaching at them um it's different from essentialism which is like this is the bare minimum you need to know Jesus Christ, what is going on with the scratching and the thing? Um, but uh, yeah, the essentialism is like just this bare minimum philosophy. I'm much more like let the kids lead the lesson. Critical theory is all about the concept that uh, a child's educational life is inseparable from their social life, their political life, their their gender, their sexuality, their home life, their parents, their you know, whether or not they're abused, medicated, whatever. Like a, it's this old thing, you know, there's the, the, you can look up the blueberry story. It's a really famous thing about educational <laughs> philosophy where this guy um, is this big businessman and he, he owns this company that makes the best blueberry ice cream in the world. And he's a multimillionaire because of it. And he gets hired to go speak to some teachers union about how to run a school like a business and how to be a better business school and make money in the district and blah, blah, blah. And this teacher says, what do you do when you get a big shipment of bad blueberries? And he says, I send them back. He said exactly, and the teacher says exactly. We don't send the blueberries back. We get them overslept, underslept, abused, neglected, overmedicated, undermedicated, overfed, underfed. We get them poor, tired, hungry, sick. We get them in every way, shape, and size. And unlike you, you get the right product. You make the, you get the right supplies. You make the right product. We get all these different things, and we still make the great same same great product, which is the functional adult. Um, and that's the difference between teaching and business. Um, Check out, if you're into critical theory and you're into thoughts like that, uh, Bell Hooks is a really cool, uh, she was an English professor, I believe. She's an a education philosopher and, and whatnot. Um, this book is called Teaching to Transgress, um, which is all about education as a practice of freedom, teaching kids to question authority, to think outside the box, to be critical of their environment around them, and to be different than what public school teaches them which is to memorize what you're told to memorize, regurgitate it on a test, forget it next week, move when the bell tells you to move, you are impotent to change your situation, the authority figure has told you what to do. Um, Not a fan of the way we run public education in this country. But uh, yeah, teach children to transgress and teach children to, uh, to question authority because they're about to be the authority. That's the fucking point of education is to make them the authority and they need to know how to do that appropri- appropriately rather than just doing what they're told. That's how you get Congress. <laughs> it's 
Exactly. And I tell them that all the time. It's like, it's, uh, you, you can't stay quiet, guys. Come on. Yeah. Say something. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, uh was oh, it not uh, to give the you Lorax you once said, is, unless, they, sorry. Oh, no, I was going to say, to give you an idea of how conservative the school is, they have a Second Amendment uh, raffle every year. They raffle off a semi-automatic gun. Uh, multiple. Jesus actually. of Christland, dude. Or should I say yeah. New Mexico? Yeah, that's was so it not? Fucking <laughs> it's ridiculous. That's so dystopian in a country that struggles as much as ours does with kids getting shot to death at school by semi-automatic weapons. That is just so dystopian. Mm -hmm. Wow. <laughs> Yup. It's, uh, it's ridiculous. It and I've Lorax. spoken out about it. And... Ahead, yeah, sorry. but it's not going to. Yeah. The Lorax once said, unless someone like you cares a whole awful lot, nothing is going to get better. It's not. And uh, I think your kids need to hear that and think about that uh, because it's not just an environmentalist message. It's, it's, it's a message for like being a, a person in, in, in civilization and the way that we've gotten to where we are now today. Um, me personally, mm -hmm. You want to talk about an educational uh, uh, biscuit? Uh, I, uh, my favorite, like my hero, my whole life, um, the, the my favorite literary character is Don Quixote de, Cerv uh, de la Mancha. Don Quixote de la Mancha by Miguel de Cervantes. Um, mm -hmm. Don Quixote has always been my hero. I love him very much. He is my guy. Um, and my favorite quote, I looked it up really quickly. Um, he's defending his lunacy. He is insane. Um, and he says, when life itself seems lunatic, who knows where madness lies? Perhaps to be too practical is madness. To surrender dreams, this may be madness. Too much sanity may be madness. But maddest of all, to see life as it is and not as it should be. The whole point of life is to make things better for everybody around you and for at least for yourself. And to see things just as they are and not as they should be is the maddest of all. And I've said several times that when I was a kid, I was raised by the boomer generation that told me that's just how it is. Just deal with it. Why are there so many people mm -hmm. starving? That's just how it is. Just deal with it. Why do so many people need, you know, food and, and, and clothes and houses and jobs and medicine and healthcare and love? Why is there such a de you know, deprivation of these things? That's just how it is. Just deal with it. The flower children of the sixties are finally being reborn in the, the, you know, millennials and Gen Z now because <laughs> My whole career path has been to get the kind of clout and leverage that I need to make that shit not happen anymore. And now we've got Gen Z and Gen Alpha's crazy asses coming along behind us to actually put in the, the real work because they're ready to punch a Nazi. And I'm so excited for it. <laughs> and so like, yeah, dude, um, oh, yeah. radicalize your children. And, 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 and that's, that's for me, that is 100% teaching kids that they have nothing to lose but their chains is never, ever, ever a bad choice. It just isn't. So I wish you all the best. And I, I think, you know, calling, you've already called so many great organizations. The National Center for Science Education is also an amazing organization that specifically fights legal battles to make sure that uh, evolution and climate change are taught appropriately and effectively in public schools. There are great resources. Well, they're not a huge organization, but they might be able to point in some good directions. Um, and don't ever be afraid to call your reps either. It doesn't fucking work, but sometimes it does. Um, I've been calling my reps literally every single business day for several months to ask them to denounce genocide, and they don't seem to give a fuck about that. But like sometimes, <laughs> one time, what one of my reps came through and made sure that our, we got better food stamps because I grew up on food stamps, and one time they tried to take them away. And to his credit, Jim Inhoff, the motherfucker who threw a snowball across the floor of the Senate to prove climate change wasn't real, Made sure my yeah, family okay. had food stamps. He wrote a He actually wrote a personal letter and made sure we had food stamps. So sometimes it helps. <laughs> um, it, it's worth trying. Uh, just don't ever give up on making sure that education is solid for your kids and for everybody else. I can definitely do that because it's one of the most important things for me for my children. Sure. I won't be here forever, but you know they need certain uh, yeah. skills and. Damn it, they're going to have that when they leave my house. <laughs> Damn right. If, if you're willing to put up with this godforsaken channel, then I know you have the wherewithal to fight this battle. <laughs> all right. Well, thank you, uh, both of y'all, so much. I just, I've been dying to ask you what you do, or, you know, with, with that sort of thing, and so glad I was finally able to. Now I've got some, uh, yeah. some ideas, and it's time to Feel put Feel free them not to use all of them. <laughs> I am a 
I am a spicy bitch and I will absolutely go farther than necessary <laughs> on a lot of things. So, you know, take it with a grain of salt. All right. Thank you so much, Dr. Chick. We appreciate you. Of course. Thank you. Thank you both. See you later. Bye Get bye. back to work. Goodbye. <laughs> Super nice to have her call in. She helps us every single week. Uh, hey, it's the end of the show, or close to it, which means it's time now to talk about the Super Chats. Uh, can we get the bar out of the bottom of the screen so Austin isn't mostly forest? Uh, we've got uh, $10. Thank you so much. Uh, $10 from si <laughs> Silent Tetrapod um, with the T. I like that. Forrest, what is your favorite shark and why is it the goblin shark? Also, do ticks have any real benefit to their ecosystem other than spreading disease? Both of these questions. How dare. Um, goblin sharks are fine. Like, whale sharks are amazing. Whale sharks are so fucking cool. Dude, are you kidding me? Also, have you ever seen a black tip shark? They don't give a damn. They're just friendly. Those, just, just, they just hang out. You just hang out with them. They just do whatever. They just shark about. And they're not going to hurt anybody. Nurse sharks are chill. They don't give a shit. They just hang out there on the bottom. They're not going to hurt anybody. I would say if I had to pick one, black tip sharks or like reef sharks that aren't going to, they don't bother anybody. They're just cool. Just hanging out. If I could hang out with a whale shark, I would poop every pants in the room. Love that. Um, and then poop ticks. every pants in the room. Yes, That's a great sentence. Every pants. Poop every poop pants. Poop every pants. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'd be so excited. Yeah. Uh, and as far as ticks are concerned, uh, not only are they food, so like that's a thing, and they they do they you have a nutrient cycle, but also they're vectors for all sorts of things besides just vac uh, 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 viruses. They also transmit lots of parasites uh, and and other and bacteria. They transmit bacteria quite a bit. They're 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 great. They're really necessary for all sorts of living things to live. They're just not living things that you want, and that's fine. They're doing their job. The e ecosystem belongs to the bacteria and the parasites as well. Remember that. It's not just about the pretty things. The ticks are part of the ecosystem, and the bacteria that they vomit into you to give you Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever is also part of the ecosystem. And it's, I think that's beautiful. Do you want to take turns reading these, or do you want to just have me plow through them? I'll read one. I'm asking you. Sure. $5 from Lothlin, who says, who asks, any thoughts on the announced closure of the Duke Herbari Herbarium? It strikes me as a horrid example of the anti-intellectualism plaguing modern society. I'm not aware of this, so you take it away, Forrest. Uh, damn you, I also was not aware of this. Um, so yeah, it looks like the herbarium at Duke University um, is being closed. I don't know why. Um, I'm looking at, I just found a, uh, a New York Times article. They said they simply can't afford to maintain the herbar it's the, one of the largest herbariums in the United States. Apparently, a lot of scientists are pissed off about it. A lot of researchers and a lot of the public are urging them to, to change their mind. Um, me, personally, if I hear something like this, my first question is, what's your fucking football budget? You know what I mean? Like, if you, if, if you're, you were a research institution, the job of universities is to produce intelligent, capable people and the best damn research in the country, not athletes. You're not there to produce athletes. You're that you can house athletes. Athletes can go through your thing. Radical, super cool. That's fine. But like the, the, the usual criticism of higher education is that it mainly functions to produce new university professors. That's fine. At the end of the day, you go there to do research. And like America is already falling behind in the world in terms of like how much scientific research we produce. China is now producing more science than we do. And that fucking pisses me off. Um, is there was a time when we made the best damn science at the crazy rate. So when I hear things like this, yeah, that's, that's my first thought is like, I understand it's out of the budget. I understand money's tight for everybody. What's your president paid? What's the, what are the, what are the, what's the board paid? You know what I mean? What are like the main, the, your, your high council of douchebags? What are they paid? Because if it's Usually. as much as it takes to save the herbarium, maybe they can lose a hundred thousand dollars a year and still be very rich. And that would be fine. You're fucking Duke University. You pay yeah. fucking, it's like $12,000 a credit hour. Keep the goddamn herbarium open. <laughs> like that's, I don't know, man. It's usually sort of the answer to everything in late stage capitalism when it's like, oh, well, you can't, can't pay employees more because then inflation will, we'll have to charge more for the things. And it's like, no, or just what is your CEO paid? 
Because if they're yeah. making $50 million a year, could they make $30 million a year and be okay? Is that po yeah. I'm sure they could. I'm sure that yeah. they could. <laughs> That yeah. was one thing that blew my fucking mind. I saw a, a, a report talking about it was like Elon Musk and Jeff Bezos and all these like, just the mega rich top one percent of the one percent, and they the, the statistic was saying these people could lose literally ninety nine percent of their wealth and still be the richest people in the world. And I was like, yeah. that doesn't make any sense. That doesn't sound right. There's no fucking way. I did the math myself and I double checked. No, that's right. They could actually lose 99% of what they own and still be the most wealthy people on the planet with more money than they could possibly spend in a lifetime on purpose. And it's like, dude, fuck you for any, any child who ever can't afford school lunch should get to like one good slap. You know what I'm saying? Like, there's no yeah. way. There's no way. <laughs> Honestly, Ugh. like, like this, this all like, like straight up fuck Ronald Reagan. Cause that's where this all goes back to is just like, that was yeah. the beginning of America going like, you know, how we have checks and balances in place to make sure monopolies can't happen and to make sure that like everyone is like making yeah. enough money yeah, to survive antitrust and laws thriving. and all that. Yeah. yeah. He just was like, no, what if actually we just let the top, we just, we make it so that you can just make as much money as you can get away with. And then it's like, ever yeah. since then, it's just been a race to the bottom for, uh, for everyone other than the top earners of, you know, I mean, it's just, it's yeah. Yeah. Yep. For sure. It's madness. Yep. Uh, five pounds from mystic mind analysis. I've been feeling suicidal lately due to recent tragedies in the trans community. I needed to hear that I'm valued. Thank you, Forrest. Um, I want you to listen to me right now. If you're watching, I hope you're still watching this. I just want you, you and everybody else to hear this. This is not a platitude and this is not just me saying flowery shit. And this is not me being an influencer. This is Forrest Griffin Valkai being a human being with you for five fucking seconds in this weird way. I'm genuinely happy that you're here. No matter who you are, I am really, really genuinely happy that you're around. There are some shady people in this world. I'm glad that they're here so that they can be people because life is fucking cool. And I want you to be a part of it. And I want to share it with you. Cookies taste better when you share them with friends. And I want to, I want to share the cookies of life with you. That's a callback to something I've said before. If you don't know the thing I've said before, that sounded very strange. And I'm okay with that. I just want you to know I'm glad you're around and, and uh, you deserve help and love and compassion. So if you're struggling, please call 988 because you deserve it and we deserve to have you. I echo what Forrest said exactly. We're glad that you're here and you are valued and you matter and all that stuff. And I know that that sounds like platitudes, but it's true. It's just like, no, like, yeah. I don't know. Life's, life's, life sucks. Life's hard. Life's like, all these different things. But like, it's also just this thing of like, it's fucking cool to get to exist and be here amongst all of the horrors and the joys yeah. and everything. And I, and I hope you stick around and watch the show with us because, uh, you know, music is cool and, uh, movies are fun and, <laughs> you know, yeah. stick around. Give me one yeah. second. I got to step out of the room for one second. I'll be back in like 30 seconds. You keep doing whatever. Okay. $10 from Felicia by nature says, congratulations on the new dog forest. Uh, and thank you so much for saying that Felicia. And thank you for the $10. And, uh, hopefully it is his dog and he gets to enjoy that dog and he doesn't just dissect it. I hope that was just a bit because I, that did look like a real cute dog and I wanted to spend time with the real cute dog five dollars from monkey at typewriter who says i don't know if forest can be trusted with children of any species man looks expecting for a dissecting great show amazing puppy uh lol lol lamau um i'm sure that uh yeah that that, that this is obviously from being a, a donor you're saying this in in good faith that it's just a funny bit about forest but i yeah that, I didn't know that that was a, that's a, obviously an ongoing joke here at the line and with Forrest, uh, but I that's would strange. trust Forrest around my baby if I had a baby. Yes? It, it certainly is. <laughs> and that's how, it, that's how it reads. That's how it reads. And thank you. Thank you for letting me know. Uh, I think we can move forward if we, 
five dollars from Eric Chin, who says, "Forrest, I love you." He's not even here to to, to hear it. I, he's probably peeing. That's probably what he's doing. Um, but if Forrest can hear, if he's got his earpiece still in, maybe, and he can still hear the show, Forrest, Eric Chin loves you, and maybe he'll watch back the show, and um, you know, hopefully he'll he'll be able to receive that love. Thank you, Eric. Thank you so much for your support. Who else we got? We've got two ninety nine from Eduardo Cotu. I'm gonna I'm gonna try my best at that pronunciation. Cotto, Cotto. Uh, hello from Down Under. Awesome job, guys. Oh man. Well, hello down there from up over. Uh, I I tell you, uh, I'm one of those people. I'm one of those like insufferable people who's like, I can't go. I can't go to Australia because of the spiders. And every time I talk to someone who lives there, I'm like, if I come visit, will I have to deal with the spiders? And they're like, mm -hmm, for sure. You're not going to not see a spider, see the big spiders. You're going to see them. And I'm like, then I can't go. And people are like, but your country has mass shootings. And I'm like, I understand that. I understand it's irrational. I understand that my country is worse. I get that. But I don't, my brain is still just like, I can't do the big spider. And then people go, they're really nice. The huntsman spiders are really nice. And I go, I don't care. It doesn't matter. Brain doesn't understand that. All brain see is too big of spider for it to be. That's too big of spider. Because if I were to accidentally step on that and it made a big crunching noise and maybe even made like some kind of vocalization, was like, eh, when I step on it, that's too big for spider to be. So I can't go down there, unfortunately. But thank you for the two ninety nine. Twenty dollars, holy moly! Twenty dollars from Whiskey Spirit Guide says, "Here's some extra scratch for Puppy Chow." Jimmy, go puppy yourself. Awesome show, and I do know that. I do know that the Jimmy go fuck yourself thing. I think from the last time I was on the show is a a thing that always plays. Um, awesome show. Can't wait to find all of Austin's stuff. On that tip, allow me to be self-promotional here for a moment. Somebody mentioned earlier about uh, how they an episode of my podcast featuring Forrest where we talked about atheism helped them along in their uh, deconstruction process. That's still an active podcast. It's called People Pleaser with Austin Archer. Uh, there are live video episodes on my YouTube channel if you prefer a video format and I do the show live weekly and then there's also an audio version on Spotify and Apple podcasts that usually has some additional audio baked into it and like some music and things like that that aren't on the YouTube version. Um, I also stream it live on TikTok if you want to check that out but also you can just watch my content at your pal underscore Austin TikTok Instagram and all the places Austin Archer on YouTube. Uh, yeah thank you so much appreciate you. Four ninety nine from Megan Marie. Austin, why do I feel like I've seen you in a movie, but I can't quite put my finger on which movie that might be? Because you might have. You might have. I'm in movies out there. I'm in TV shows. I also just might have shown up on your phone. A lot of people, like, I live in Los Angeles, and a lot of people, when I bump into them on the street, will go, where do I know you from? And they're like, did I meet you at a party or something? And I'm like, could it, could be that? Or I just sometimes I'm you're just scrolling on your phone and this face is on the phone and you don't know who it is. It's just white mustache guy and there's a lot of white mustache guys on the internet, so it could be that. But I'm in a handful of movies you might have seen. You can IMDb me. I'm in three movies that are coming out in the theaters this year, and that is the most movies I've ever had in the theater in a single calendar year. So. Definitely, if you go see any one of those three ones, you're going to be like, I saw that guy on the line. Uh, but yeah, could be. And maybe it was Mindhunter on Netflix. A lot of people watch that show. Maybe it was the movie The Night Clerk. That's another one that's on Netflix that a lot of people just like stumble upon. But could be. What else we got? $5 from PhD Tony who says... 
re snail reproduction we were talking about snails shooting the darts and all that stuff stabbing partners to make them horny puts that whole crucifixion narrative into a completely different context oh that they were it was a little bit of a sadomasochist kind of thing a little bit of a dom sub thing a little bit of a a little bit of a bdsm type thing i definitely do think that there's a lot in christianity and christian theology that feels very like torture fantasy feels very like uh like like they're always talking about getting like the eternal torture realm and hell and everything like that so i don't know there does seem to be some kind of torture kink with a lot of theists particularly christian theists uh if you want to take a take a jab at that one for us we're talking about how you know the no, shooting no, I, the darts. i'm listening i've been listening the whole time I, okay I, great I, i'm now gonna go run yeah. and do a thing off camera okay. while you take over for a bit that's fine i i want to start a petition that austin archer reads all of the super chats from now on on every show because that was delightful i loved every second of that the whole the whole thing was great especially that whole thing about spiders loved i was laughing my ass off in the other room like trying to just like quickly pull myself together so i can get back in here i uh said at the beginning of the show i'm fighting, fighting a stomach bug uh over the past uh 12 i'd say 20 minutes i've been getting progressively more nauseous <laughs> and i just had to go hork and like try to come back here and be a person i am i am quite ill <laughs> so we've got yeah the, 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 i i agree entirely with what austin was saying there at the end was like having a uh, that whole twisted sadomasochistic thing uh, somebody was talking about you got some you know uh, uh, skinny uh, uh, dude getting uh, whipped up on a cross. It's it's pretty kinky. I I don't know, man. I'm I'm into it. I'm into whatever the discussion has been thus far on this. Continue on with the super chats. Uh, Ten dollars from Shy Froglet. Uh, howdy, Forrest and Austin. Austin is gone. Austin has left us. Um, may he rest in peace. Uh, happy to catch part of the show live. P.S. Forrest. When are you dropping your hair care routine? I'll drop it right now. Um, I, 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 I shampoo and I condition and then I get out of the shower and I take like a very small amount of something like some leave-in conditioner or something just to make sure that's not too frizzy. And I do this and then I go about my day <laughs> and that's the, that's, that's the whole thing. Sometimes I'll blow dry it when I'm in a rush. That's the that's it. Um, here's a fun fact about me. Aaron Ra knows this. You might not. Is oh, I'm not. I can't even be a pineapple today. It's not. It's not even. It's just too curly at this point. I was usually able to get it. To just I look like a racer head coming up in here. Um, Ten dollars from Adam Schrodron. Um, Forrest, I'm an atheist. Uh, brag about it. I don't believe in creation. Uh, I also have some skepticism for abiogenesis theories. I know I uh, they feel incomplete. Uh, which theory is your favorite, and why is it RNA world? It actually is RNA world. Um, and there's a lot of reasons for that. Um, so a couple of things to notice about abiogenesis, and these are the things I've talked about. I'll be brief, uh, but as brief as I can be about this, is that, number one, life is made of four major macromolecules. Those are proteins, carbohydrates, lipids, and nucleic acids. Those four major macromolecules are made of simple building blocks, um, uh, things like amino acids, fatty acids, uh, uh, sugars, um, and, and nitrogenous bases. The cool thing is that all of those chemicals self-assemble, not only in laboratory settings, but we have found all of those things in space. So clearly these things form by themselves. And for a long time, the sticking point with creationists and such, we're like, oh, well, you don't know how they then become the macromolecule itself. We're actually getting there. There was a paper published last year talking about how, uh, you know, simple peptide chains elongate on the surface of micro droplets of water. Um, so sim amino acids form basic built the simple protein chains. Um, just this year, there was a paper about illegal, uh, illegal ribonucleotides, um, developing in response to, uh, some like very common minerals. So you have these nitrogenous bases building basic RNAs. Um, and it just, like I said, just illegal ribonucleotides, not like huge polyribonucleotides, just little, you know, kind of not, not a few chunks. Um, and like I said, we're we're getting there more and more every every day. 
And so we know a lot more now than we did 10 years ago. And we know a whole hell of a lot more 10 years ago than we did 20 years ago and like blah, blah, blah. Um, as far as the RNA world hypothesis is concerned, um, there's different concepts of how genetic information started and how like reproduction and like actual life gets going. Either DNA came first, RNA came first, protein came first and was somehow a carrier molecule, blah, blah, blah. I'm a big fan of RNA world because um, RNA works not only as genetic material, but also as a catalyst for a ton of biochemical reactions. And if you're into epigenetics, um, remember epigenetics is not changes to the genome itself, but changes to the way that the genome is expressed. You can use micro RNAs for post transcriptional gene expression regulation. So you can be like, I already have the DNA is transcribed and exons, it, you know, cut out, introns spliced. You now have a mature messenger RNA and use micro RNA to silence it, to, 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 to flag it for de um, degradation. And then you now have gene control that isn't actually genes controlling it. It's just the RNA. And even if you don't take that, like, just look at the basic central dogma of, of biology that DNA becomes RNA becomes proteins, um, transcription and translation. What you get this, this micro or the, this, um, uh, mRNA that's going to you know, code for a protein. What reads it? A ribosome. What are ribosomes made of? RNA. They're made of ribosomal RNA. So RNA reads the RNA to make the protein. And then what's bringing the amino acids over to build the protein? Oh, that's right. It's transfer RNA, tRNA. So RNA is read by RNA to send signals for RNA to bring amino acids to assemble a protein and build fucking phosphodiester bonds, y'all. RNA does everything. And then that's not even counting. There's small non-coding RNAs. There's large non-coding RNAs. Get what's one microRNA. MicroRNA is a small non-coding RNA, but there's also, you know, a mil there's, there's fucking uh, uh, 50 different kinds of RNA that all do different jobs in your bodies. And a lot of them are for gene control that goes beyond gene regulatory networks that are already coded into your DNA, y'all. Where do you think you get them from? Motherfucking RNA does so many things. So yeah, I'm, I'm all for it. Um, and I like RNA as a molecule. It's really cool. And I could go on a lot more of a tangent about it if you wanted me to. But I encourage, as always, if you're interested in these topics, check out NASA's Astrobiology Primer. I'm going to put it in the thing right now. Um, there is, uh, they're on version two right now and it's for free online. And it's like a couple hundred pages long max. Anybody could read it. And it's very easy. It's, it breaks down everything we know about stellar nucleosynthesis, about planetary formation, about abiogenesis. It breaks down the difference between RNA world versus DNA world versus protein world hypotheses and why they were, I think the last version was from like 2016. So it's a few years out of date, but it's not anything bad. Um, check it out. It's in the chat right now. So read that bitch. and. Uh, Tell me why I'm right next time you want to send a super chat. RNA. It's a cool guy. And it's got uracil. Think about that. Uracil. Cooler it's than got thymine. uracil. It's got it's motherfucking got uracil, dude. You know what DNA has? DNA has fucking thymine, which is more stable in a double helix configuration. But at the end of the day, fuck it. You know what I mean? Uracil is what makes the, it, it fills in that space for RNA. And it's really cool. Really cool. You want to talk about molecular epigenetics? I'm in a molecular was, epigenetics course this look, semester, like and I'm really totally, excited about it. I was not with you for that whole thing. I was like, Forrest doesn't know what he's talking about. RNA is bullshit. And then you said uracil, and I was like, wait a minute. And it changed the whole now you're thing. On, for you me. get it. You get it. You get it. Yep, that's, now you I understand. Get it. Now I get yeah, it. <laughs> that's, you understand. That's, I'm in a, I, I happen to be a, this, this semester, I'm taking a course on uh, molecular epigenetics. Uh, for funsies and it's a uh, fucking it blew my mind to shit because it's it's a such a fucking like underserved field we there's a lot of things we don't know and learning about fucking micro rna and post transcriptional gene regulation i man the amount of fucking poop that flew out of me when i was so excited it's just so cool i i would bet my left dick that in the next 20 years of of research we are going to learn like the way that like some some seriously new awesome ways that genes are regulated beyond our wildest imagination. It's going to make major strides in our understanding of evolution, and it's all going to come down fucking epigenetics and especially about uh, you know uh, uh, small non coding RNAs. 
Um, they're just so cool. They're so, I could talk about it for a while, but I'm not going. That's that's all. Um, did you did you say you would bet your left dick? I did. Yes, I would. Okay, so not your yeah. right one. And you are no. saying that you are that you are ha, are by like you have you have two two phalluses. You have. <laughs> I I feel like two is an assumption because there you know no, no nothing saying could there's not three. left right and center. It could be yeah. at least it's. I'm saying at least two. I'm saying at or least you and and you know what the whole thing in half and say the left half of my dick is the, that's why it's it's really it's it's a matter of context and, and really what's more important is you know. What, if I'm saying, is it my dick because it's on my body, or is it just a dick that I own and it happens to be the one that's left? <laughs> Maybe you know. And you know what? Actually, good point because with all the dissecting that you're doing, we don't know Maybe how I'm, many dicks are. How in many the house. dicks I've collected? Exactly. You have right. no idea. It's a mind your goddamn business. Is the point, Austin? Is what I'm saying. Yeah. <laughs> Hey, $10 here from SJL, who says, and this is a big um, correction of a point, mm. I, or something I said earlier in the show, and I'm thankful for it. Atheists in Congress via Wikipedia, Jared Huffman from California, Barney Frank from Massachusetts, Pete hey. Stark from California, Juan Mendez from Arizona, all Democrats, also Thomas Gore from Oklahoma via his grandson, Gore Vidal, uh, too few. Uh, so, you know, there have been some. Mm. Yeah, I'd, see, yeah. I, I understand. Like, when you said that, I thought we were talking about, like, open, like, outspoken atheists. May and maybe those people are, too. Uh, yeah. I I was 100% on, on board with you. I, I was also mistaken, because I thought that that was uh, just a well-established fact that there's never been anybody that hasn't professed belief in some... Excuse me, I'm real burpish. I, I was being sick earlier, but, like, I hasn't professed belief in something. But, like, yeah, no, who knows? Mm -hmm. Maybe uh, maybe there are these people. I don't know. Um, five dollars in the Raven two hundred. Pronouns he him. I'd be livid if I had kids and their school is pressuring them into prayer. Jimmy, go get forced to listen to my awful singing voice for twenty four hours. How bad must it be that you are willing to send five of your hard earned dollars to threaten someone with it? Um, five dollars <laughs> from Monkey get. Typewriter. Yeah, go listen to me. Jesus Christ. Yeah. Um. Uh. Re for a suggestion. This is the way. Uh, tell the kids to engage. Pissed off parent isn't news. Students fighting religious indoctrination is. That's what I'm thinking. Like, is it for me? Uh, that was how we were at at school. As we were always willing to to you know be obnoxious. That's why I went to the bad kids school. But um, like it it was. I, I think it's it makes you a better person. I think it's really cool. Four ninety nine from Jesse motherfucking Jerdak, the 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 handsomest man. To ever fucking grace us with his presence. Yeah. Are you familiar yeah, look with how handsome, just, Look how handsome this photo is of this guy. Just the, the very handsome and guy. Look, it's ridiculous. It's actually a little bit offensive that he's this goddamn yeah. handsome. Uh, and he's so it handsome that he sent us $5. Feel, it kind of makes me feel like he's like bullying me. Like he's like, oh, look at you. Are you mm -hmm. sure are handsome? And I'm like, no, you know what you're doing because yeah. you're the handsome one. Yeah. I didn't. I didn't even notice his, his. That that is his thing. Look at these handsome and entertaining fellows. I didn't even realize that's what he was saying. Bring it back. Roll it back. Put put that one back on the screen. Put yeah. put his thing back on there. I want to make sure I read the rest of it. How dare he condescend to yeah. us? They're handsome and entertaining. Boy, howdy, uh, Jesse. That's what. Uh, put. I've been in a room next to you and felt ashamed because I have to stand <laughs> next to you. And have you? I don't know if you are familiar with Jesse Jerdak. He's he's a, a a great guy. He's a a, a just a, a he's a mama bear. He's a, a lovable guy. He's just the gentlest, nicest, sweetest, most compassionate, thoughtful, generous, caring, uh, uh, kind, benevolent person you've ever met. He's also a goddamn just mountain of a person, both in stature and in personality. The dude is like I can six see eight. It. He, he's yeah. he's. So I'm six two. You've met me in person. You you are you and I are about the same height. If if you're not, I think you might be a little bit taller than me. Um, I'm 5 This guy. So I'm I'm under you. Are you really? I could have sworn we I'm were like. Up. Huh. Okay. Nah, well, it's, it's, so it's, yeah. Yeah. this guy is fucking just huge, and he's like my body weight in each of his biceps. He's just this jacked as shit mountain of a dude who would just like 
nourish and care for anything and just 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 the most loving kind sweet dude and he looks like that and then he's gonna come up in here and tell us oh we're so handsome and entertaining uh fucking you know what dude i'm gonna buy you a hamburger next time i see you because i'm so upset about it uh yeah. five dollars from kim five dollars from, uh, from kim oh, yeah. austin i spend a lot of time on film youtube and your review of argyle has given me life i really loved it forrest you're here too, I guess. I feel like I she kind of, I mean, she gave, she gave you the little wink and the tongue out. So she's obviously saying, I love you too, Forrest. But if anyone wants yeah. to know, I do. I have an hour long review of the movie Argyle where I tell you the entire plot of the movie. Yeah. And I think it's more fun than watching the movie. I so. would actually watch that because I have seen the movie and it was the worst thing I had seen until I watched Madam Web. Uh, it was yeah. good God, it was bad. Um, that's, yeah. that's the beginning of the movie. The trailer is it's not Madam Web and like that. Okay. I guess I'll see it. Um, it was bad by the way. Uh, while we're on, before I forget, um, I mentioned at the very beginning of the show that I recently got back from Denver, Colorado, and that we did a massive fucking charity project for doctors without borders. Um, Jesse Jerdak led that project with me. He was my business partner and all of it. And he was the DM for the game that we played. Um, mm. dude's a goddamn rock star. And you should subscribe to him on all the channels as well. Look him up on here on YouTube and also on TikTok and also everywhere else. I believe he's got a Patreon in the works pretty soon. So if you have some scare, spare cash, you want to keep your nose to the what, 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 keep your eyes to the prize. Keep pay attention to what he puts out because he would it would be cool if you supported him too. Eventually, when that happens, Whiskey Spirit Guide sent ten dollars, uh, turning in my fur, uh, forest token. Can you tell us about the evolution of the human gut biome? What's really cool about that, I can't tell you the evolution of it, like how it got there, because like every fucking buddy with a gut has a gut biome, unless you're specifically raised in sterile conditions. So it's been around for you know longer than there have been humans. Um, but what I can tell you is that uh, your microflora um, is actually a part of Neo Lamarckian evolution. So like you can, here's a really cool thing, like take rats that are raised in a completely sterile environment so they do not have a gut biome and they will have a lot of problems gaining weight because your gut biome is one of the things that helps extract nutrients in the food you eat for example cellulose which is what makes the cell walls of plants you can't fucking digest that shit you ain't got the enzymes uh, bud but like some of the dudes that live in your intestines they do have those enzymes so when you eat a salad these guys eat it again and what they poop out is what you absorb through the villi and your small intestine and gain nutrients from how cool is that um, and so, uh, you have these rats that are raised in a condition where they don't have any, you know, uh, gut biota. Uh, and so you do poop transplants, fecal transplants. You take poop from other rats and shove them up the sterile rats. And not only will they start gaining weight and getting the proper nutrients they need, they will take on the physical characteristics of the rats from whom they received poop of the poop donor rats. So if you take uh, an obese rat and a lean svelte rat and put their poops into different rats, the rats will become either obese or svelte and lean, depending on the poops that they got the donor from. Um, uh, because it is that fundamentally important to your ability to process and retain nutrients from food. Uh, and this is one of the many reasons why we talk about, you know, like uh, 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 weight and health. And you'll hear a lot of doctors and, and, and biomedical scientists pointing out the fact that like, you know, weight isn't like, it's not a visual thing that you can just always ascertain immediately. Oh, this person is this healthy or that healthy. Um, body fat retention and deposition has so much to do with your gut fauna or your gut flora with, with genetics. Um, there are racial factors that go into it because of, of the genetics thing. There's like a million different factors that go into that. And you can have different like body sizes and shapes with that don't correlate the way that our society tries to correlate them with health. If you're interested in that, um, check out this book called The Secret Life of Fat by Dr. Sylvia Terra. Um, I had to read this for my undergrad physiology uh, class, and it fucking, it's so cool. Um, the way they talk about like the genetics of fat deposition and, and they talk about gut fauna in here. I think that, that experiment with the rats, I'm pretty sure I learned about it in this. Um, but fat is an organ y'all it's not just a thing that hangs on your body 
It is an organ. It's its own set of specialized tissues with their own blood supply, their own neurovasculature, their own function that they do specific things. Um, if you're a, a anatomical female and you're postmenopausal, like your ovaries aren't producing estrogen anymore, the fat in your body does it for you. How cool is that? Uh, it's it's really fucking cool, dude. Just look this up. It's really neat. All right, five dollars from Monkey at Typewriter, who says actually the quote is by the one slur, not the Lorax. The Lorax just leaves the word unless. God, are you even a real biologist? They're really going in hard on you here for us. Damn. For misquoting you know, well, Doctor. They might be right. I don't. It's been a minute since I read that book, and what's embarrassing is that on my uh patreon when you sign up for my patreon you get a thank you note that it starts with that quote and it's you know cited to the lorax so i might have lied to a lot of patrons i don't know um <laughs> that's that's rough it's real rough um 10 um nimbile zucchini dollars uh from deepak stevens Kudos on the good boy who sat on for us laugh so sweetly. Winston, my dog, says hi. I don't know what's happening with that dog. Um, my wife just brought home this pup and put it in here with me. Uh, and I know a lot of you are hearing that and you're like, well, obviously you have a puppy now. You don't understand how many weird animals have come through this house because of me. And so for her to do this, isn't it doesn't mean necessarily what you think that it means. Um, one time I was working on a, uh, 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 I was some, one of my last jobs I worked for an exotic animal sanctuary and they wanted to build a new enclosure for the ringtail lemurs and we didn't have any place to put them. And they were going to put them in like these tiny bird cages for a week just to like have them be somewhere. And I was like, we can't do that. You guys not like tiny, tiny. like they were like big parrot cages, but they weren't enough for them to bounce around in. Um, so they lived in my guest bathroom for like a month. I had two goddamn ringtail lemurs bouncing around my guest bathroom. And I didn't tell anybody either when they came over. I just told them where the bathroom was. <laughs> and then they opened that shit and got lemured upon. Um, we've had so many. I had to bring a boa constrictor for a while. I had a parrot cranking around because I didn't have anywhere else to put the parrot. Uh, bringing home a, a puppy. Who knows what that puppy is for? Perhaps the puppy is just to taunt me. She would do that. <laughs> she is that way. <laughs> um. Five dollars four ninety nine from Sammy W. Uh, Mom in New Mexico. I was once a kid of Christian parents in New Mexico. Prayer was mandated at my school. Put those people on blast. You may, may it changed the life of a kid like me. Yeah, dude. Never be afraid to be obnoxious. You never underestimate the power of somebody who has no shame. I did not work for the Tiger King, by the way. I saw somebody say in chat, "No, that was that was not my job. I did not work for Joe Exotic." This is wild. Twenty seven ninety nine from Tim Uruski, who says, "What a great host combo tonight, Austin. I loved your recent video on conservative gender ideology. Fantastic! Oh, thank you so much. But holy smokes, twenty eight buckaroonies. Uh, they're not real. Wow, thank you. Mm. They said Canadian okay. dollars. They're just they're not real. Um, yeah. So that's like that's like four dollars. So something like that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. More theoretical dollars." Five dollars from the Raven 200. Uh, hey, all you reading this, I love you, you dorks. Life is better with you here. Please don't give up. No Jimmy joke here. Please take care. For real. For real. This, this is a, a big, beautiful, stupid world, and I want to experience every part of it, and I want everybody else to, too. Was it not uh, the Struts, I believe, um, who wrote a song called Could Have Been Me? And it's really a song about like achieving your goals and dreams and things like that. But uh, yeah, what's the struts here? Um, they in that song. Oh fucking shit, dude. Um, the uh, I want to taste love and pain. I want to feel pride and shame. I don't want to take my time. I don't want to waste one line. I want to live better days and never wake up and say it could have been me. Uh, just a great song about exploring everything in life and wanting to experience everything. I want to feel the regrets and the shames and the bad stuff as well as the pride and the wonderful good stuff because that's all part of the ride. I just put that song in the chat. You should listen to it. It's a really fucking good song. Uh, 
The water deer. Oh, you're talking about musk deer? Let me double check. Yeah, you're talking about musk I'm, deer. I'm, yeah, the Chinese one. Okay, yeah. I was like, surely he knows what this means. Because I was like, I have no mm -hmm. idea what this is, but yeah. They're great. Yeah, so Chinese water deer, they're if they they're deer that let me see if I can pull up a picture of one here. Um blap. Nope. Should I actually make that small and put it in the middle there and then open up my OBS and put the OBS over here, and then I can do that. Look at that guy. These are these are Chinese water deer. They have fangs. They're great. What? Why? Look at that guy. Yeah. These are there I believe these are in the musk deer family. Um but uh they're really cool because they are if I remember right um these guys uh they uh they're like the only ones in the cervid family that don't have t uh, uh antlers at all 0% like all cervids have antlers chinese water deer don't but they do have fucking tusks and I don't remember, I, I'm pretty sure that's correct. Somebody correct me if I'm wrong. It's been a long time since I had to know this. Um, it's like their antlers just them, grew out of their their mouth instead of yeah, their yeah. head. You want to yeah. talk about weird-ass deers? You ever seen a munt jack? I have no idea what you just said. <laughs> munt? That, that was like a saber-toothed yeah. deer. Like That was like a saber-toothed tiger, yeah. but a little deer. Wow. Yeah, yeah, combine that with some fucking stink glands and you've got a munt jack. Check this out. Let me see. Oh, fuck. Uh, we we'll do the same thing. We're going to do that and then we're going to do that. Um, yeah, these are munt jacks and you can take a look at this thing's face. These That's are scent real. glands. They, they puff up. They puff out. Like They look like nah. blisters that pump out and they, they squeeze out scents. And uh, no. they're just great. They're great little guys. This is a munt jack. No way. I love them, and they're so gross looking. Absolutely not. They're great. Nope. I don't believe it. That's <laughs> wild. That's crazy. $5 from Nexix. Nexix, Forest, any books for someone just starting to read nonfiction, reading Sapiens right now, looking for more on evolution, biology, abiogenesis, etc. I'm, I, I'm ju I just have a sneaking suspicion that you've got no fewer than 40 books right behind you that you could read. <laughs> recommend for this well, i've person. got this bookshelf over here as well and then i've got like the whole living room which has like the big bookshelves these are just the decorative ones behind me and this is my office that we're in right now so like this is just like mm -hmm. the shit that i happen to grab on a regular basis this bookshelf over here is the ones that i'm reading on and off from time to time the ones behind my desk there's the bookshelf over there which is the ones that i use for videos and like things and then there's the, all the books out there and then there's the book in my the shelf in my recording studio i have a lot of books um, I love, I like eating books. And if you want to start talking about introductory nonfiction science writing, um, really good book from a really problematic dude, Richard Dawkins, The Greatest Show on Earth. It's a great book that covers just like, it's just a tome chronicling all sorts of cool evidences for evolution. That one's really cool. Um, or if you want something a little bit, uh, oh my glob, get in there. Fucking shit. Um, you can also look at, uh, if you're into, to, um, anthropology, especially like archaeology, looking at things, uh, Jared Diamond's real famous. Uh, he wrote, uh, uh, this book called Collapse, um, which is all about how societies collapse, uh, just like how societies fall apart. And when you're done reading that, pick up Questioning Collapse, which is a compendium book that challenges everything in this book. These are other archaeologists who go along and say, hey, his evidence in this kind of sucks, and here's why. And you can read both of these and go back and forth. This was my favorite part of, a, I was in a, a human and environmental interactions course for my first master's, and like, this was part of the curriculum, was to go through these two and look at like, you know, societies that disappear, genocides that happen, whatever, and like, challenge yourself by going through two different person, uh, uh, groups of, uh, of uh, uh, you know, theory to two different, you know, archaeological theories. Um, that was really cool. Um, I would also recommend if you're, this isn't biology, but it is cool. Uh, pick yourself up a copy of Astrophysics for People in a Hurry. It's a really good one if you're just starting out and you don't want to read anything too long. 
you want to do one, don't want to put in the grad school work there. Um, this is Neil deGrasse Tyson, and it really is written in plain English for anybody to understand. It teaches you some really cool fundamental shit about the universe. And honestly, the best part about biology is that it incorporates all the other sciences. So this actually will help you learn biology, learning a little bit about astrophysics. Those are my ideas for right now. Those are my recommendations for this moment. Excellent. $10 from Jacob Waters, who says, Austin, I'm looking forward to seeing you in Horizon this year. You know what's funny is that I realized as we were talking that this is there's sort of a full circle moment here because the last time I co-hosted the line with you, Forrest, I was in a hotel mm -hmm. room in southern Utah shooting those movies. So I was actually yeah. on location filming those movies. And now today, the next time that I'm back on the show is the day that the trailer came out for the movie. So I'm like, that's a really, you know, we get, we had a nice little moment of symmetry there. So yeah. I love that. I love that. Yeah. I hope that everyone enjoys it. Uh, five euros. Are they even really five? What's, you know what I mean? From old man's pain, uh, is booger farming a legit science? Maybe everything is, maybe nothing is. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Could be, sure. Yeah, well, it depends on how not? deep you're getting, uh, how deep are you getting into the analysis of the booger, and you know, and the, right? what's inside of detailing the, the it out. Sample. Yeah, yeah. Five dollars from Terry. Oh. Do, do wisp? Do you know how to say, say that last name? Uh, the Wispelaire. The wisp. That's good the enough. The Forest. Do you think dinosaurs had their own version of? Now you would know how to pronounce that word. Osidax I think it's just Osidax. Or... Yeah, Osidax. Osidax. Okay. Osidax. I right. would say os actually, and I think because those are the worms that like burrow into whale bones and shit. Um and, and munch away at those when we have whale fall. Mm. Um and so uh if like those guys they 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 slurp the fats and things out of like bones. Um, as far as whether or not dinosaurs had those guys, I don't know of any like Osidax worms that are terrestrial or anything like them that's terrestrial. I, I, off the top of my head, I'm sure there is something. So, like as far as their own version of it, if there was such a thing, they would likely still be around today because that's not a niche that changed with the KT extinction. You know what I'm saying? Like there are still bones. So, like if such a thing exists, and there were there were aquatic reptiles. Big ass ichthyosaurs swimming about. So, like, those guys would have probably been munched upon by something. Probably them. Um, yeah, I would say it's 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 reasonable as far as like when you say their version of it, absolutely yes. Something was filling that niche. As far as was it a worm? I have no idea. <laughs> it does not my area of paleontology or what I what I, I know for, for a living. Um I do know some cool shit about whale evolution, though. Hold on a second. Um, this one. Uh, yes. So these two papers were just published from, or one of these was just published. The other one is a little bit older. Um, these actually came out of my department that I'm in right now. Uh, that I'm. Uh, this is from this year, I believe. Um, a new species of basilosaurid. New Basil Sore Whale. This came out of uh, my department just a little bit ago. I didn't write this. I didn't work on this. But we they found, some of my colleagues found these fucking awesome new, like, early proto-whale bones um, and were able to calculate, you know, the size of this thing based on these amazing fucking, like, look at these teeth, y'all. Look at these teeth structures. How cool is that? Um, and then this one is from a little older. This is actually written by uh, Dr. Eric Snively, who is also in, in my department that I'm working in right now. This is the guy who graded my oral exams for clinical anatomy last semester. So I would discuss, you know, cool intricacies of human anatomy. And this motherfucker right here, really nice guy, um, genuinely super nice dude, uh, published this paper back in 2015, bone-breaking bite force of Basilosaurus isis. And what they did here is they were able to look at this amazing ancient whale. Let me see if I can find the, the diagrams here. Uh, they were able to use the muscle attachment sites 
that we had from the skull, as well as like bite patterns on like other uh, uh, animals that these things have been munching on, and reconstruct the muscles, and then reconstruct using some really intricate physics and math the muscle stressors on the skull and where they would have been and actually calculate the bite force of this freaking extinct whale and talk about how it was able to crush bone uh, with with a force quite like a little bit stronger than like a saltwater crocodile today amazingly cool stuff what paleontologists are able to accomplish i happen to be working right now in a paleontology department but i myself am not a paleontologist and so i'm just around these amazing fucking people who are so much smarter than me that are like coming out with these amazingly cool things about like here's this amazing ancient creature and not only can i tell you that it existed i can do some math and grab some calipers and measure its toe and tell you how high it could jump and some other weird shit and i'm just blown away because i'm over there just cutting up dead people like can you teach me that please because <laughs> i'm there to study anatomy it's a whole thing dude it's a whole thing i love my job i love fucking research and stuff uh 25 dollars from vidvita 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 velvita vidalia vidi vidi vida. yeah fantastic show thank you very much i appreciate that that's very kind of you five more dollars from the raven 200 you gotta stop sending so much money when did why did what what, what did one monkey say to the other monkey when he got getting yeah, kicked in the nuts Ouch, macaque. I'm sorry, I'll show myself out now. Go fuck yourself, Jimmy. I love that. I love that. One time, I was uh, doing a, a thing. I was working at that animal sanctuary, and we had these, uh, you know, a cockatoo is a this big parrot. Um, and there are, uh, they're called umbrella cockatoos, um, which they have this big, like, crest that comes up over their head when they get excited. Um, but their scientific name is Cockatua alba, which means white cockatoo. I believe Cockatua is the, the genus, but I know alba is the, the species name. Um, and so they're like related bouncy to creatures, and they're like fun. Jessica. They're related to Jessica, Jessica right? Alba, yeah. Yes, yeah. related to the, to the Jessica alba species. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, I was out there like gathering up people to teach them about it. I was having fun. I was like, so I got my big white cockatoo right here and I'm going to take my big white cockatoo out. We're going to be bouncing our cockatoos all over the place. You want me to put my cockatoo right up here in your face? You can take a good look at my big white cockatoo and just like this the whole, the whole time just having way too much fun with that shit. <laughs> rest, rest my, rest my cockatoo right there on your forehead. I'm just going <laughs> to. <laughs> I love that. That's great. Uh, macaque. 49 from poor Claire. Macaque. Do we get calories mm -hmm. from fiber or not? Yeah, I'm pretty sure. I mean, I'll, I'll, because like some fibers are indigestible and like you'd have an issue with it. But like I'm, fiber is just like the colloquial term for like the cell walls of plants more often than not. And there's a lot of that that you absolutely do get calories from. But some of them like psyllium husks. Had, hmm. I just had my first uh, colonoscopy and they're big their big recommendation to me at the end of it was eat more fiber. But they did say that I had a very good looking colon that had no hey. cancer. In it. So that's good. That's pretty good. You know? Yeah. It, yeah. It, it, I just double checked to make sure I wasn't telling lies and I, I'm not Yeah, it, it depends on whether or not it's soluble or insoluble fiber. If it's an insoluble fiber, it's not soluble in water. It's going to pass through your GI tract relatively intact. You're not going to get anything from it. That's what psyllium husks are all about. Whenever somebody tells you, like if you are uh, constipation, um, you take psyllium husks. They're literally just like seed husks that your body can't break down. And they just gently scratch the inside of your intestines. And that causes your intestines to produce some extra mucus to help alleviate the scratching and to, to not get scratched. And that mucus flushes your poop out real easy. It makes it real slippery. But, um, uh, but a soluble fiber is something you're actually going to be able to like break down. It's going to have a higher what we call bioavailability. You're able to like actually use and incorporate the, the nutrients. So, like, yeah, certain fibers you can get if you eat bread. Bread's all fucking carbohydrates and 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 plant fibers, and you get nutrients from. It. You know what I'm saying? Watch my video on bread. Everybody, go to my channel. Watch my video on bread. You'll love it. Unless you like bad things. I, I, I don't know. What um, so anyway, 
we all came here for one reason. That was to celebrate your colonoscopy. And so thank you for being here to share that moment with us. Congratulations mm -hmm. to you. Um, F's in the chat for Austin's colon. Uh, but <laughs> uh, before we wrap up, um, everybody, uh, Austin, thank you so much for doing the show with me, man. Like, seriously, it's always a joy to do this with you. Oh, it's so much fun. I'm sorry that I was uh, 20 minutes late, but it's uh, yeah, it's, okay. it's, it's a blast. We didn't really we didn't really have um, anybody to fight with today, but I think that we did have some really nice things to talk about and to, you know, uh, definitely like some moments of hopefully being useful and and hope, mm -hmm. hopefully fun and entertaining. It felt like a fun, fun ride. So thanks for asking yeah. me to come do this again. Most definitely. You are welcome back anytime you'd like to be. Seriously, is the door is always open. You're a great host and you're fucking fun to talk to. And uh, even I had to walk out of the room and go heave, and it was still great to hear. Um, but uh, are you yeah, sick? I, are you like sorry. throwing up sick? I feel like hot trash. Can't you tell? Oh my I'm god! Not well. <laughs> it's actually crazy um, that, that that this is how you behave when you're like throwing up from being sick because because you seem just so pleasant but that's i guess that's it just depends. how forest valkyrie rolls years of talking like this have made me incapable of expressing myself in any physically painful way or like <laughs> conveying that i'm yeah. any sort of discomfort it no i it's just, it's just a little stomach bug i i am not actually if i was like feverish and and raspy it would be one thing put a label but the label on psyllium says it is soluble and earlier you said cellulose breaks down but that's Insoluble, I thought. Uh, it. I don't. So maybe I'm missing something here. Like cellulose is broken down by the the like your gut flora. Um, it's it's not broken down by itself. Like it's not. I, I don't think it's a water soluble thing. That's that's specifically what I'm talking about. Is like, does it break down in your gut by other things, or does it pass through you relatively unscathed? I might be mixing some things up in my head. This is all very much sprung on me. And I believe you've asked me nutrition questions before, and I am not a nutritionist, so I might be missing something. But like, I'll double check. I'm I'm 99% sure that like fibers either are carbohydrates or they are something that breaks down very similarly to them, or they don't break down, and so then you don't absorb them. Um, and I don't mean those as like an either or thing. I mean like they are one of those things all the time. Um, like, I'm not saying that's the definition. I'm saying they can be these things. Um, but yeah, I'll look into it. I'll double check because I, it, shit, dude, there's, there's always something that I don't know. Um, I, I, I don't focus on nutrition, but I'm, last I checked, 99% sure that when we say fiber, we're either talking about complex carbohydrates that your body does not have the proper enzymes to, to break down. Or we're talking about some other, probably a protein, some sort of plant protein, once again, that you just don't have the ability to digest. And then we discuss whether or not they're soluble or insoluble, meaning are they going to be broken down in your body or not? Um, and if they are something that can be broken down, you can actually absorb nutrients from that because it's just an organic molecule. And if they're not something you can broken down, then you're, you're fucking not. And they're going to be roughage that helps push things through your intestines. Um, but again, maybe I'm missing something. I'll double check. Uh, in response to what you were saying, this is just, I'm just a stomach bug. I'm just feeling a little bit under the weather today. I've woke up feeling weird. I've had a hard time with food today. I'm in and out of feeling queasy. I'll be fine in 24 hours. I've got to give a presentation tomorrow over molecular uh, over epigenetic inheritance and in plants. So that's where my head is. All right. And then on Wednesday, I'm giving a presentation over fossiliferous species in the Carboniferous or in the uh, Cretaceous period. How cool is that? You're always doing stuff. I mean, what what one fun thing about hanging out with you on this show or whether you come on my show is I really just like having you talk about things that I my brain just goes, just let him talk now, and I just go, I have no <laughs> idea what Forrest is saying. And but it's also funny too that you do this show and that theists regularly come on to argue with you because I'm like, how would I just, where do you, again, Dunning-Kruger, the confidence matching the, uh, you know, the, the level of intelligence, but it's like, uh, or, or being juxtaposed to the level of intelligence, but it's like, I just, how do you, how would it, as a theist, would they hear you talking about 
biology or any of the things that you know so much about and be like, I'm actually going to school this guy on this topic. I just, I'm like, where do you get off? Where do you get the audacity to think that you can go that toe to toe? He's not going to be able to have an answer for you. You know, I would rather, you know, <laughs> at risk of sounding an arrogant because I don't want to. I, there's so much more that I don't know than I do. And I'm just a let, dude. Let and I just do it like for you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> at yeah, at risk of sounding arrogant, I would say that I would rather they try than just keep it to themselves and maintain thinking that like all of us biologists are just sitting around a table going, yep, 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 evolution, uh -huh, uh -huh, instead of actually fucking checking. Because like that's yeah. that's what a lot of times it is, is like people are like, oh, you just you just believe what your professor told you to believe. It's like, no, motherfucker, I've done the things in the lab. I've I have tested it myself. That's part yeah. of getting an undergrad degree. Um, and I did that a few times, but yeah, that's, it's yeah. a whole thing, dude. Um, yeah. but yeah, it's, it's been a phenomenal show. Thanks so much for being here. I don't want to take up any more of your time. Everybody go subscribe to Austin's things. All of the things that Austin does go find him everywhere. I, like I said earlier, uh, he is yet to produce content that I have not enjoyed. I haven't seen everything you've made, but everything that I've seen has been top notch. Uh, so I always encourage everybody to, to go your way. Um, I'm Forrest Valkai, uh, uh, much to your chagrin. Uh, thanks so much for tuning in. Have an awesome rest of your day and never stop learning. Bye bye. Oh, fuck. God damn it. I forgot that we have the scroll now. That was supposed to be the end. That was supposed to be, it was supposed to be over right then. I thought that it was just going to be done. I'm, I'm embarrassed. I'm an embarrassed, I'm a very foolish man. This is my action.